you want to talk about black mold, personally, um, I like to say I feel like I almost died from black mold in 2006. Um, black mold produces deadly toxins and I've done, we've performed at Spinago Wellness Institute so much research comparing the toxin levels, uh, over 6,000 trichothecene toxin levels we, to multiple biomarkers. We've correlated immune suppression, um, hormonal suppression. It's really just um, incredible how toxic this toxin is. The trichothecenes are produced by stachyboitrous and fusarium molds, and these toxins, um, the only toxins known to man, and this will answer one of the questions about the sense of smell, the only toxins known to man that can kill brain cells without first going to the bloodstream. So I'm going to take questions uh, first, on first come, uh, first serve basis. I will do many consults. If you want to come on and ask questions after I cover a few of the ones that were emailed in, then please uh, let everybody know. We got a whole entire team here. So let's start with David. We'll cover Europeans first. We currently have a few Europeans here. We have David um, from England. And David asked, I have an astrocytoma brain tumor. I have drywall in my bedroom. Is there a treatment from which we can cure my brain tumor in Great Britain or even in any other European country? Please and thank you. David, first of all, I uh, want to sincerely say I'm sorry you have this tumor. Um, German research that I read years ago has proven that the trichothecenes can cause astrocytomas and glioblastomas. And actually I had a sister-in-law who died of a glioblastoma <clears throat> years ago before I knew anything about mold toxicity. Um, she was a redhead. Redheads always have the mold toxin genetics. And she taught in very old schools in Philadelphia that were full of black mold. Um, can you guys get, go to Sheridan uh, from Australia? Uh, I, I don't know who in Great Britain uh, can take care of this. Um, we have three folks here right now from England. We've had a lot of patients from England and all over the world. The key to getting beyond the brain tumors you have to do two things. You must get the trichothecene out of the brain tissue. The trichothecenes destroy the brain by multiple mechanisms. The primary mechanism by which they destroy all cells in the body is, is for the reactive oxygen species. They cause lipid peroxidation, destroying fatty tissue, the brain is 60% fat, let me rephrase it, 60% fatty content. Uh, this, this young lady came to me in 2014 and she had contracted Lyme disease on a camping trip, spring break uh, of her senior year in high school. And she developed a significant Lyme infection very quickly because her immune system was shut down from the trichothecenes produced by the black mold in the house. This was a 2014 case, you can see June of 14. Most people who get diagnosed with a glioblastoma, which is said to be the fourth stage of an astrocytoma. And David, I don't know what stage astrocytoma you've diagnosed with. There's three stages, and the fourth stage they convert to glioblastoma per se. At any rate, the glioblastoma multiforme is a very aggressive tumor. The astrocytoma is less aggressive, more slow growing. Most patients who are diagnosed with a glioblastoma uh, live six months post-diagnosis if they're lucky. 
This young lady we treated um, again in 2014. She came to us for Lyme disease, as a majority of people do. The cerebellum is one of the prime areas of which the Lyme spirochetes love to invade. Different people, different Lyme spirochetes, uh, we see various brain regions that are infected. This young lady was a basketball player and was very good at it. And within a short time after her spring break, she started dribbling sideways on the court because she was losing her coordination. Ataxia is the medical term. On this particular slice, if one uses colors, the black is good. The homogeneous light blue you see in both of the cerebellar uh, tonsils, if you will, we call them various things. That homogeneous shutdown, the light blue, thank you, is what we see with the trichothecene toxins. I have said for years, as the majority of physicians who have studied environmental medicine and the scientists, that <clears throat> the lipophilic fatty and molecular structure toxins, industrial toxins, pesticides, etc., will always shut down the frontal lobe first. The caveat to that, my patients have proven, we now have close to 2,000 PET scans in our database, is that the trichothecenes tend to affect the cerebellum first. Um, and I'll rephrase that. The cerebellar Purkinje cells tend to be more sensitive to, to shutdown from trico. So the homogeneous light blue is the effect of the cerebellum being extremely underactive. My theory was, and my patients have proven, uh, that toxins are going to hit the brain on both sides, bilateral effect. It's just really common sense. But infection can choose a side, as many of you know, and I would extrapolate from my days in my first medical life. I fell in love with the heart in medical school and I've done a lot of critical care medicine, a lot of emergency cardiac medicine. In fact, we treat a lot of patients in this clinic, in this room, with atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Uh, if they have Lyme carditis, for example, or various things, we can treat it here. Um, the brain is, though, the most complicated organ, and it's so important, and the brain runs every other organ. What we see through previous functional scans, MRIs and CAT scans that I grew up with <clears throat> did not really give us function. So the first functional brain scans were SPECT scans, which measure blood flow. <clears throat> and originally I did a lot of research, I performed a lot of research with um, the gut-brain connection, looking at SPECT scans. I referred them to the Amen Clinic various aiming clinics throughout the country. And I would correlate the SPECT scans with brain chemistry patterns uh, and, and changes in brain chemistry that were caused by candida overgrowth and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth called SIBO. And you can watch a PBS video and learn more about that um, public broadcast video off the website. But once I was able to get PET scans at a reduced price, PET scans will actually measure the glucose metabolism. Fascinating, this three pound brain will burn 30% of our glucose. In a recent study I read, it said something very fascinating. The more we think, the more glucose we burn, and it makes sense. Spec scan imaging has proven, and had proven by the mid 90s, that the cerebellum should be the most active brain region. Looking at an inferior view of the brain, we look at the cerebellum and it matches what we're seeing in this young lady. And we have light blue versus black is significantly more underactive. Me, the yellow is more underactive, the green is more underactive than the yellow, the orange. And with all this infection, it would be a massive Lyme infection the Lyme spirochetes love to cross the blood-brain barrier. 
the majority of my patients have no blood-brain barrier. The trichothecenes and other fatty toxins destroy the blood-brain barrier. Among all this underactivity caused by the Lyme infection in the cerebellum is an area where the green, much more underactive than the yellow or light blue, goes back to a darker blue, and that is the glioblastoma, because cancers metabolize more sugar than normal cells. So within this area of underactivity caused by infection, we see a glioblastoma. Now look, this young lady was coming out of her wheelchair. She had tried for eight years from age 18 to age 26 to come out of her wheelchair. We work on the mitochondria. We work on a cellular level. We enhance mitochondrial function. Your mitochondria are the engines that run every cell in your body with the exception of red blood cells. Your killer cells, your antibodies, the engine that runs them is the mitochondria. And German research years ago, I read these things like 2008, 2007. Uh, I've read thousands of studies on trichothecenes. Germans proved that the mitochondria will mistakenly imbibe trichothecenes that are floating through the bloodstream. They'll imbibe them from the bloodstream into the, into the, their, the engines, okay? The microtubules bring the toxins in. They mistakenly imbibe trico and some of the petrochemicals, attempting to burn them like they would burn fatty acids, good fatty acids. Middle chain triglycerides like you see in coconut oil, et cetera, et cetera. So when they mistakenly imbibe these toxins they can't burn, the mitochondria activity, the functional activity shuts down. In fact, most mitochondrial scientists suggest that all aging starts in the mitochondria. And the easiest program we have is our anti-aging program. If I can do healthy wellness instead of the most toxic and the sickest people in the country uh, that we've been taking the last few years, um, then those patients can double their brain function and physical function. One of the most famous hockey players in the country came uh, in the summer of 16 for two weeks benching double, squatting double. He was in a very moldy arena, black mold everywhere. And he was losing coordination because his cerebellum function, cerebellar function was shut down, so he's less coordinated, which is extremely important for a professional sports player, especially a fast game like hockey. In this young lady's case, this, the infection grew for eight years but within the infection in the underactive area, if you can bring that back up one more time, you'll notice we have this tumor. <clears throat> it was one of the most difficult things I could do. We're getting this young lady out of a wheelchair after eight years by getting her mitochondria to work, uh, by waking up her brain. The brain runs the immune system as it runs every other system. <clears throat> and we didn't need a PET scan. Everybody wants to do a PET scan now. I'm getting PET scans for the same price I paid for spec scans uh, years ago because we do, we do such high volume. And really, um, the family says, I don't want to pay for a PET scan. She's doing great. We don't need it. And it was actually here in my heart and not in my brain. I have to be honest that I said, you know, I'll pay for the PET scan. I've just got to have a PET scan. I didn't really know why. Because if a patient is doing extremely well, why would you order the scan when you're halfway through the treatment? Well, it, it was a God thing, and the glio was diagnosed, and I sent her back to Australia <clears throat> and talked to the, the most wonderful, the nicest university professor I've ever spoken to. And I said, was it a glio? And he said, yes. And he had worked with her for years with other folks in Australia trying to get her out of a wheelchair. 
They operated at University of Sydney, and she's alive today. We see her pictures on Facebook all the time. So it's three and a half years later. This is June of 14. And people ask, well, why would she live three and a half years with a glioblastoma diagnosis? And the key, in my opinion, is A, you've got to get the fatty toxins out of the fatty tissue. Detoxing the bloodstream is simply not enough. That's all we did in 2009 and 10 and even 11. I've designed protocols that infuse healthy fatty acids that move into the fatty brain tissue and move the toxins out. At the same time, alpha lipoic acid, phosphatidylcholine will move in the mitochondria and move the fatty toxins out and wake up your mitochondria in your heart, your brain, your kidneys, every organ. <clears throat> so when you wake up the brain and you wake up the mitochondria within the killer cells and antibodies, you have an immune system that works. And it really doesn't matter whether you're killing Lyme spirochetes, Bartonella, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, Epstein-Barr, herpes, HIV, it really matters not what you are attempting to kill. You need kill power where God intended and not a foot off the floor. And that is what we have in every industrialized country. Depending on what city you live in, I can tell you throughout America and Canada, and we're getting to the point in Western Europe, I can tell you what cities you want to live in and you don't based on petroleum chemicals. Petroleum chemicals have saturated our soil and our water for years. They're liver toxic. Here's the problem. Those of us that have Northern European genetics, and it's not 25% of Americans, trust me, it's way more than 25%. Very dominant gene, a gene that inhibits your ability to effectively remove mold mycotoxins from the bloodstream. So if you do not remove the mold mycotoxins when they come through your skin, when you breathe them in, trichothecines even go through the eyes. Those of you who've been in the worst gas chambers, you've had burning in your eyes when you leave work. Um, in the worst case, with the most saturated trico gas in a room, patients develop nosebleeds. These toxins are so destructive to every fatty lining, the sinuses, the bladder, interstitial cystitis. The best research on the destruction caused by trichothecines to the intestine, and the intestinal lining is out of the University of Marseille. The best research on how they destroy the chondroblasts that make the cartilage and repair the cartilage. There's one study out of China. If you're going to claim to be a specialist in environmental medicine and a specialist in treating mold toxicity, you have to read studies from all over the world. And because I went down, I went from working 70 hour weeks in one month, moving to a bad office in a hospital in 2006. January 2nd, I moved to a ground floor office from a chief of anesthesiology office on the fifth floor in a Tampa Bay hospital. And in one month, I, I went from working 70 hours a week to lying in bed a week and working every other week. In the week I worked, it took me four hours to get to work, four hours to get out of bed. And many of you know what I'm talking about if you have mold toxicity. You feel like there's a cast on your body and you can't move. Every cell in the body is destroyed by the trichothecines. And these black molds, they're stealth killers because they, the black molds don't smell like the aspergillus penicillin molds, the musty molds. And they're hidden 
under windowsills. They are hidden uh, behind the fireplace wall. Fireplace flashing is leaking. You don't know that. Your family, uh, family room fireplace wall, it looks great on this side. Behind the wall is black mold. You can have a washer work loose on the bathroom spigot and it's drip, drip, drip behind the wall. And you don't know there's a problem and there's a huge black mold infestation behind the wall until the ceiling starts to fall through. I've been sabotaged by all these things and my patients, there's all kinds of stories. And even in Southern California where it supposedly doesn't rain according to an old song, the Spanish tile roofs, they always leak around the edge. So these toxins are killing Americans, they're killing people throughout the world, and the worst patients, the most trichothecine toxicity I see, the worst black mold toxicity I see is out of England. I have lots of patients from England. It's wet, it's humid, and the buildings are old. And this young lady living in Australia was exposed to black mold in schools, homes, and she had the trichoth effect on the cerebellum, and she had the cancerous effect that starts in the mitochondria and works its way through the cells. The trichothecenes also affect the RNA DNA. They cause what's called fragmentation, et cetera. There are multiple ways in which they cause cancer. So if you have an astrocytoma diagnosis, David, and you're living in uh, the United Kingdom, there's no doubt in my mind that you have black mold hidden behind a wall somewhere, if nothing else behind the shower tile. <clears throat> Can you get a glioblastoma from other causes? Yes. Uh, the brilliant Alan McDonald, who emailed me not long ago and told me he had ascertained that ticks are carrying worms. So many of the worms I see in blood smears that I always assume were leaking across a leaky gut lining may actually be coming from tick bites. And he is uh, performing research now in which he believes, and I need to get this scanned to Alan and talk to him, that Lyme spirochetes are also causing glioblastomas. Uh, if you have an astrocytoma, and there are actually two patients, uh, a mother from Nevada, I think, and David, you in case, two people asking about astrocytomas. And I've never done a webinar where people ask me about astrocytomas. If you're still at the astrocytoma level, then you need to get to a place that can mobilize these toxins from the brain tissue and the mitochondria out of the brain, into the bloodstream, and out of the body and prevent the progression of the disease. You also, at the same time, will enhance your immune function. And there's multiple other things you need to do. Hormonal imbalance and hormonal optimization, we don't even mention it on a website. It's, it's basic. Nutritional support. Intravenous nutrition bypasses the gut lining that will not absorb the essential amino acids and minerals. Those things are basic in our practice. You have to have certain hormones optimized to activate the killer cells. Testosterone activates interleukin-6, which activates killer cells. Um, thyroid is the, number, the primary hormone, potentially, for activating killer cells. And sadly, in a chapter I wrote for Suzanne Summers, uh, it's on the website. Read it, print it out, and make notes on it. I discuss how these toxins shut down the hypothalamus and subsequently shut down the pituitary and then the pituitary hormones don't turn on the thyroid or the testicles or ovaries. So it's, we look at 550 biomarkers in a consultation. My consultations are three hours. I can go on for, go on for hours about <clears throat> what you should do if you have cancer. We don't advertise for cancer, but we treat cancer patients. So if this young lady can have a glioblastoma, which is further advanced and more deadly than an astrocytoma and she's alive and well today, uh, then hopefully you can achieve the same thing. Uh, I know nobody in Europe that does what we do. Um, 
There's a very famous clinic in Germany. Uh, we just had a patient come here, referred by other patients in that clinic, for some of the things we do with Lyme disease. It's um, often easier to treat cancer than Lyme disease because all the patients with chronic Lyme disease have biofilm and we proved by 2012 that the biofilm is uh, as it's spun by these organisms that one can't kill because their immune system is so suppressed they sequester these toxins. It was a theory I had in 2012 and we proved it first in Carol who was on the biofilm page of my website. So. I'm going to move on to a mother. Uh, it's LeMay, LeMay, excuse me. Emil. Say? Emil. 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 That's a pretty cool name. Um, not seen that one before. From Nevada. And you're asking, can you detect mold in the brain when doctors are claiming it's not possible? My son has an anaplastic astrocytoma stage 3. Again, there's stage 1 slow growing stage two stage three and could it have come from showering in a bathroom that appeared to me as having black mold well I hope you have answered your question um, and again I'm not saying that the trichothecenes produced by black molds are the only thing causing astrocytomas or glioblastomas but I know very well my sister-in-law who died at age 37 from an a glioblastoma worked in schools in the Philadelphia school district that were over 100 years old the older I'm, I'm sorry am I competing against Donald Duck what is that that's her. oh that's her okay um, so if she wants to come on and ask a question Emma are you there I am hi you coming in very well I apologize we had such technical difficulties on the GoToWebinar side, and uh, thank you for hanging in there. Ask me some questions. Your question will be so powerful. When I answer it, if I haven't already, it will answer questions for another 200 people on the webinar. So go for it. And let's see if I can come up with a good answer. Okay. Since we have got the diagnosis of astrocytoma and we have done what the doctors have suggested. We have also now done some alternative medicine. Um, we are seeing some shrinkage, but I'm wondering what it is that if in fact, how, how can we, how can we find out for sure if this could have been caused by black mold and if it is, or if it isn't, um, if it isn't, then, you know, of course, we move forward with what we're doing. But how do we, how do we detect that it is caused by black mold? And I know that you're saying that there is a treatment for that. But how, how do we go about detecting um, if there are mold spores? Well, this isn't about, uh, I apologize. This isn't necessarily about mold spores. And I have spent 10 years attempting to get doctors and patients, and it's, slowly we're getting there off the spores and onto the gases the gaseous metabolites so you're seeing black mold you think look the majority of the patients in my clinic don't see black mold the majority of them have it hidden behind shower tile we were better off with the old plastic tubs I grew up in a rather modest home and we had one piece plastic tub uh, everyone wants the fancy tile and grout. When the grout cracks, the water goes behind the tile. The gas is out gas. Uh, if you see black mold around the shower tile, there was a lot more black mold underneath the shower tile. And here's the deal. You're not going to know for sure. You can do mycotoxin levels, and you may have a zero. You may have an absolute negative on the mycotoxin levels initially because these toxins do not hang around in the bloodstream for long. If you have, first of all, let me ask you a question. Um, are, you, are you blonde or redhead? Are you Northern European genetics? German? Um, uh, Irish? Uh, uh, um, Turkish. Turkish. 100%? Both 
my parents. Yeah. Well, that's you may you may be lucky. Uh, the darker the skin, the less prevalence of the mold toxin genetics. But I have I had a Pakistani engineer here who had it. Um, I have people from Dominican Republic who are very dark, but. Years ago, the Spaniards and the British were everywhere, and so these genes get passed down. Um, first th step is to test your son for the DNA, through DNA testing and see if he has the genetics from which he cannot effectively remove these mycotoxins. Here's the deal. You don't have to have the gene to be suffering from mold toxicity. You just remove these mycotoxins way less effectively, and some say 485, 500%. I think that number came from Richie Shoemaker initially. Um, you're not going to prove, per se, unless you get a very fancy lab, that there are mycotoxins that caused this. But when you read about glios and astrocytomas, all kinds of toxins can cause mutations <clears throat> within the DNA and RNA. And here's the way it works. A Texas Tech study from several years ago, I think five years ago now, a young lady did her PhD, uh, her thesis, as I recall, on um, the trichothecenes and proved they're 10 times more liver toxic than alcohol. And I saw this pattern years ago. It answered a question of why one guy can drink 30 years, two liters of vodka a day and not have cirrhosis, and somebody else drinks three years and gets fatty liver. Um, in fact, and I knew immediately before this um, scientist proved that the trichothecenes are this toxic to the liver, it was causing fatty liver. In fact, um, I read a recent study, and I'll teach you where I'm going with this in a moment. Can you bring up the cytochrome P450 uh, enzymes, guys? If the trichothecenes are 10 times more liver toxic than alcohol, then it, then through deductive reasoning and common sense, one knows that they shut down the liver enzymes, the detox pathways, 10 times more than alcohol. We now have one out of three Americans. I'll step out of the way. One out of three Americans I read a few months ago on a Saturday night, and I think about three or four weeks ago, I read a study on a Sunday night that now the WHO, World Health Organization, says one out of three individuals in industrialized countries have non-alcoholic fatty liver. Does that scare you? And in my practice with patients from all over the world, there's no one in my clinic with, who does not have the mold toxin genetics. Uh, I have a patient whose mother is Cherokee, or grandmother is Cherokee. I don't see it in Native Americans. I don't see it in pure African Americans. Um, I have an African American who works for me, and she does not have that gene. Uh, she's the only person in my office who doesn't. So, at any rate, these phase one detox enzymes, can you still see me in the camera? We're trying to do this live for the first time. So, there are seven enzymes in phase one liver detox. Um, look, you guys worry about these SNPs? I want you to go, all of you, to my YouTube channel and put in the, word, the name Therese, a 62-year-old Canadian lady who held this. These were hers. And she said, she's a professor, and she rocked and rolled, and she did the work of three women for, until age 40. She lectured in North America, you know, Canada, America, wrote books, a brilliant PhD, who had been told by multiple wellness progressive, anti-aging doctors, whatever you want to call yourselves, functional medicine doctors, that this is why she was sick. The lack of common sense, even among the brightest, is, is so amazing in the medical world. If you have these genetic SNPs in your chromosomes, that these enzymes do not detox as effectively as other people, then you've had them since you were in the womb. So tell me, those of you who have spent a lot of money on this test, I used to do it, I do, no longer do it, because my, our research at Spinago Wellness Institute has proven that the trichothecenes, 
when you correlate 6,000 plus trichothecene levels with dysfunction in detox, you quickly learn that trichothecenes will shut down the enzymes in phase one detox and phase two more than the genetic SNPs. But you've got to use common sense, folks. You've been told by a lot of doctors who are out there learning and reading, and you've got to give them credit. But they're memorizing facts. And, and DNA testing is very, very sexy, if you will. And we do DNA testing. But when you're told by your physician that this is why you're sick, and yet you did the work of three women or three men you were an all-state soccer player or hockey, whatever. You rocked and rolled until a certain time in your life. Didn't you have these as a baby? Did you not have these genes? So my point is, uh, and Therese holds up the, this page and says in her video testimonial from 2014, can we go back out? Okay, I'm sorry. That she, held, she says, I'm a very private person. And I said, I would not be doing a video testimonial for Dr. Spinagle because I'm very private. She says it right in her video testimonial, sitting beside me on a sofa. And she said, but I want people to know that I was told by multiple doctors in New York, high-end wellness physicians, after she went to Canadian doctors, that this is why she was sick. It's why she became sick at age 40 and had been sick for 22 years. But I said to her, I said, Therese, you had this detox uh, disability, if you will, since you were a baby. When did you get sick? At age 40. What did she do at age 40? She moved into a 120-year-old office in a major university. And she went to hell in a handbasket within a six-month period. So please get this concept, folks. Do you want to have four of these enzymes not work as effectively as other people? When I did this testing, all my patients had two or three of these that didn't work that well, but every one of them was a rock star. They either played high school football, basketball, soccer. They were some of the best. They were all state soccer champs, whatever. And they were brilliant people who made straight A's, salutatorians, valedictorians. So really, golly gee whiz, if you, you, know, you have it since you're a baby, why weren't you sick as a baby? Speaking of which, if your son was born with idiopathic jaundice, once I was able to ascertain in my own mind that the trichothecene was causing so much liver dysfunction, and then the grad student at the time, I believe she was, professor of microbiology at Texas Tech, proved that the trichothecenes are 10 times more liver toxic than alcohol, which means a trichotoxic liver will, will work less efficiently than Uncle Joe, who's an alcoholic, then you get it and you say, this is the difference. And we saw it years ago in, in people who drank cr crazy levels of vodka and bourbon. One gentleman in particular was actually a Floridian. And um, he decided to remodel a 69 Camaro convertible. And between the petrotoxins that he was sucking in from body work, lacquers and paint thinners, but more so, he put air conditioning in his Florida garage, but he didn't want to cool it down to 72 degrees, so he had all this humidity in the vents and all this black mold hanging out of the vents like moss, and he showed us those pictures. And I told one of my nurses who's been with me for 20 years, I said, Gary, this is the answer. The, the $100,000 question in medical school, how can one guy drink 30 years, no cirrhosis, another one drink three years cirrhosis? And, you know, I had a school teacher from Sarasota, uh, Florida. They finally tore down that middle school, thank God. She had a progesterone dropout, which happens to you ladies in your mid-40s. Earlier, if your brain is shut down, if the LH hormone up in the pituitary is shut down, that's what turns on your progesterone. Progesterone activates the Xanax receptor. Estradiol enhances dopamine production and inhibits the breakdown. We won't jump to those slides, guys, but we, we do sometimes, we won't. But the point is, this young lady, 42, 43 years old, began drinking four, two to four bottles of wine a night versus one glass of wine she had for, di for dinner 
or with dinner for years. Why? Because the alcohol activates the GABA-A receptor, as does Xanax clonopin. So she drank three years in my world, having treated over eight, 9,000 addicted patients who had everything, all the Lyme patients and mold toxic patients. This is what's causing the addiction, changes, shifts in brain chemistry. Uh, we'll soon have a video from a California talk I did in integrated mental health. The bottom line is these enzymes may be shut down genetically in your son. If they are, they're not nearly as shut down as they would be from trichothecine and petroleum chemicals. So the, the pattern that my patients have taught me is that they get exposed to black mold, whether it's hidden. Again, often the case because you don't smell it. I had to think this through driving down the road years ago when we did over 6,000 mycotoxin levels. Why would we see the trichothecines all the time and rarely see, in a lot of the folks, the ochratoxin uh, and the um, aflatoxin from the musty smelling molds? And I'm thinking, well, people smell must in their home. They go look for the problem. But you can sit right next to black mold and have no idea it's behind the wall, etc. So these enzymes are shut down. Flip to the next slide, if you would. Phase two liver detox. And you'll see within the mitochondria and within the cells, um, OK. And I'll take a question while we're waiting. Uh, the superoxide dismutase enzyme enzymes within the mitochondria, within the cytoplasm, within the cells are also shut down. It's called phase two detox. So the pattern we've seen through thousands of people is if they have trichothecine toxicity, they cannot detox the other toxins that we're all exposed to in the industrialized world. The SOD enzyme within your mitochondria is arguably one of the most important enzymes on phase two detox. They're all important. The absence of the glutathione S transferase enzyme um, in the liver and kidneys is obviously very important. But again, this woman did the work, lectures, writing, teaching, of two or three women and raising children. And most of us men aren't that good at not much help. Some of you are. So she did the work of two or three women having all of this. In her video, again, Therese, she explains, I was led to believe by over 20 some, quote, functional medicine doctors, this is why I'm sick. But if you pay attention to your patients and you correlate lots of numbers at one time, which we do, you perform much better research in your IV therapy room than, than you can do in a university lab in rats. So again, with these issues, now this person would need more glutathione, exogenous glutathione. We make glutathione. It consists of three amino acids. The problem is we can't make enough to keep up. And while I have no doubt that the trichothecine has a play in your son's astrocytoma. You won't prove it, um, but it's most likely petroleum toxins. And we measure, we have patients that have broken every record in the world on the petroleum toxins, and they all cause cancer. They're carcinogens. And you're in Nevada. I hate to tell you, Nevada's one of the worst states for uh, Petroleum toxicity. So what, what questions, you'll not prove it, I doubt it, but your son needs to be worked up for mold mycotoxins and petroleum toxins. They're much more lethal than heavy metals. And you know this when you see all these women from all over the world who had severe heavy metal toxicity and levels that were stratospheric, they've been chelated to nothing with intravenous chelation which we do simultaneously when we treat everything else. And they still are no, they're no better, okay? So, you have another question, go for it. Uh, no, I'm just, um, I'm just observing everything that you're saying. I'm just taking it all in. Good, I'm just trying to teach enough to answer a lot of the questions that people have. Mm -hmm. 
uh, you have a question on biofilm. Did you have that question, Ellie? Oh, yes. I, I was just wanting you to um, elaborate more on what biofilm is. I think I may be talking uh, a little bit later. When I spoke at the International Lyme uh, meeting last year in Philadelphia, uh, Dr. Moress, who was the president, who has actually sent me some of the most mold toxic, neurotoxic patients, um, he said, I want you to speak either on biofilm or brain. I, I had a difficult decision. I spoke on brain, and we'll show you some of those brain scans. Can you find, uh, is a great example, Kevin from 2011. Um, biofilm should not be in our bloodstream or in our body. Our great-grandparents did not have mold toxicity. They had no airtight homes. Uh, there's a drastic surge of all kinds of disorders since 1980. And the oil, oil embargo of 73 scared the daylights out of North America, Canadians, Canadians, Americans, Western Europe, and we decided. That was the impetus in my opinion, the true impetus, and there's no doubt, to build airtight, energy efficient homes and take the old buildings, which is the worst part of the deal, that had windows and doors that would leak air and would dilute gases inside. And once those windows and doors were replaced, pretty much by 1980, we built these gas chambers. So because the mycotoxins are so immunosuppressive. And then they destroy the liver's ability to, in the kidneys, the ochratoxin is very destructive to the kidneys, it shuts down the kidney function. Then we cannot detox the petroleum, industrial toxins that we're exposed to. Foods, yes, but more so from bath water in most cities. Um, we have all this immune suppression and hence Secondarily, we have all this biofilm formation. We don't kill bugs when they first come in. Kevin came to me in 2011 uh, at age 20, was diagnosed bipolar age 15, obviously uh, was very depressed and he was treated by psychiatrists at John Hopkins, as is done in all these universities and in private practice with a dopamine blocking drug. His excessive electrical voltage was not from excessive dopamine. Um, and that causes a lot of depression. Flip to his biofilm slide if you could. Um, because it's a nice example of a picture. When we do not kill these bugs on contact, and actually um, potentially can move to the slide I have of a lime spirochete when it first comes in the bloodstream. There's like a process by which you answer these questions. I want to make sure everybody can follow A to E. A to B is easy. But when a lime spirochete or a protozoa from a mosquito bite, any of the organisms that are injected come into our bloodstream. We were supposed to kill these guys on contact. Uh, so your great grandparents who were sweating all day long doing physical labor for survival did not have airtight, energy efficient buildings. They had a lot of petro exposure, but they didn't have a liver uh, liver detox pathway shut down by trico. Again, the homes would breathe. The, uh, the uh, God's idea would be you're going to kill this spirochete. Notice it's about, it's about the length of the width of the red blood cells. You're supposed to kill it on contact. For some reason, many of the husbands that come here do. And they bring their wife. But the wives typically will spend more time indoors. Not always. More time in a moldy basement, doing laundry, et cetera. There's all kinds of reasons why. But, uh, and females have way more toxicity in general for a few reasons, particularly intestinal gut toxicity. But anyway, you should kill this spirochete on contact. You should kill Bartonella on contact. Uh, but when you don't, and you give these organisms the opportunity to spin this super glue, if you will, it's a polysaccharide matrix uh, that they spin, and they'll first spin them around themselves. And lime spirochetes have their own special biofilm, it turns out. But 
uh, move to the next slide. When you can't kill these uh, infections on contact, we should have the slide that shows his biofilm. It's just a gorgeous example of Kevin's biofilm. Uh, should be around Kevin's pictures. It's just a great example because it's right in the middle of the page. Now you'll find some of these things on my biofilm page. Um, Kevin's biofilm, we use it every day to teach. Well, give me somebody's biofilm that you can get to. Um, the organisms will begin to spin these, this polysaccharide matrix around them to build a fort to wall themselves off from our immune system, from our antibodies and killer cells. <clears throat> no, I still have, there we go, that's Kevin's biofilm. I like it <clears throat> uh, because it, it sits within, on a blood smear, it sits within the middle of the free-floating bloodstream. These are red blood cells. And within there is this little bubble, if you will. You have to think in a three-dimensional fashion, folks. So think three-dimensionally. There's lots of Bartonella within the biofilm. There's lots of protozoa, these one-celled parasites. Um, toxoplasmosis is the most studied. Yes, cats breed it, but it's, um, it's in hamburger, it's in meat. Supposedly 1.2 billion people in the world have toxoplasmosis. Um, very prominent, it loves the brain. We see a lot of these cysts in the brain on PET scans and you correlate those, I do, with blood smears. Um, anyway, so notice this very thick four-layer edge. There's great research from various places, but some of the original research that I read was from Montana State University, Biofilm Center for Engineering. And so within this biofilm are lots of infections. Uh, on my biofilm page, you'll see Carol. Can you flip the Carol for a moment on her biofilm? Carol came to me in 2012. She had six years of IV rocephin from a consortium of doctors in the New Jersey, Connecticut, New York area. Six years of IV rocephin. Three years she was bedridden. And you can, the antibiotics were destroying her more, in my opinion, than, than, the, um, than Lyme for sure. But there was a black mold uh, beach house deal. There's always a story, lots of stories. That was her 12 weeks later. Move to her biofilm next, if you would. What a sweet lady she was. Um, look at all this disaster. Within this biofilm was Ehrlichia, Lyme spirochetes, Bartonella, lots of protozoa. This is a Bartonella. The yellow arrow points to one Bart. There's just in one drop of blood, you ladies, most of you have five liters, men six liters on average. And within this biofilm were all kinds of organisms, the quote co-infections. And the blood, red blood cells that are infected by Babesia are also called into the biofilm. It's called quorum sensing. And so the viruses and spirochetes and all the bacteria, candida, yeast, various microorganisms that you should kill upon entering the bloodstream, if your immune system is suppressed, you don't kill them, and they spin the biofilm. So six years of IV antibiotic treatment, and the antibiotics will move into the biofilm just enough to agitate the organisms to spin more biofilm and to mutate and become resistant. Now, the mutation is... is has been proven in the last couple years to be more about the bugs um, sharing RNA DNA. For example, I have a German study came out recently about the Lyme spirochete stealing the one RNA strand. How small can it be? The retrovirus that causes common cold. So Lyme spirochetes, for example, will steal the RNA, just one RNA strand, that's this virus, and incorporate it into their nucleus and so the organisms within the biofilm are much more resistant. They're called polymorphic. And even the World Health Organization now says, wow, this is where we have all the, this is the cause. The causation of the antibiotic resistance worldwide is biofilm. And they say you can't kill any of the bugs that come out of biofilm. Well, the caveat to that is it is more difficult, but we do it all the time. When you get the immune system working, 
Your, your antibodies and killer cells will attack the biofilm. There was a time when we had to use intravenous vitamin C to activate killer cells. Your natural killer cells convert vitamin C to peroxide, unless you're iron deficient or copper deficient, or deficient of an enzyme called 6-GDP. Rarely do we have to. The problem is, and it was a theory I had by 2011, Carol, we first proved that when the bugs spin this glue, they sequester toxins. And, and uh, the biofilm is saturated with toxins. Now, how does a guy prove that without a university rat lab? Well, Carol's husband was a PhD in math. He loved the numbers I used, and he liked the precise testing. So you test toxin levels before and immediately before and right after you intentionally bust this biofilm. Um, and Carol's mycotoxin levels and petroleum toxin levels went up like 20-fold. Um, you have to move fast. You can't wait for testing to come back 10 days later. You have to use enough glutathione to grab those toxins. And so today in our clinic, patients will start just by making them healthier and more by enhancing mitochondrial function than anything else. Uh, patients will start attacking their biofilm and making up for years of toxin buildup within the biofilm. So when you start attacking biofilm, or rather your <clears throat> healthier immune system does, you release Bartonella. There's one outside the biofilm. Well, it's kind of wrapped up in there. Um, Babesia-filled red cells will be in the biofilm. And again, every organism. In fact, we've actually proven through before and after testing, heavy metals get sequestered in biofilm. It seems that everything that shouldn't be in your body or in your bloodstream gets sequestered in biofilm. So many people will get treated for Lyme disease, for example, and other co-infections, and they get better because the antibiotics will hit brain regions or they'll kill organisms out in the free-floating bloodstream, but then six months later they're sick again. So I'm going to ask for more questions from people but does that answer your question? Patients who don't have a lot of biofilm, let me just say one more thing about this because it's very important. I've done so much research on biofilm, <clears throat> clinical research in humans, not rats. And the patients who don't have biofilm, those of you who just became acutely mold toxic from the hur recent hurricanes, um, and you don't have biofilm, you're in and out of here in, in, in weeks. Even if you have frontal lobe dementia from the mycotoxins and petrotoxins shutting down the electrical function in the frontal lobe. We have a 79-year-old retired nurse from New York, who was in New York City for years. She doesn't have biofilm. And she came here with the classic diagnosis from a neurologist of MCI, cognitive dysfunction, whatever term they want to use next year or this year, um, pre-dementia, and this woman's brain works better than mine. She's 79 years old. Uh, she did not go backwards one day, but she worked as a nurse in very old hospitals in New York City, was exposed to lots of mycotoxins and, of course, petrotoxins. So the biofilm is the Pandora's box, and it determines the length of stay. If the biofilm is not saturated with lethal petroleum toxins uh, and just mycotoxins, we can move much faster as well. Uh, it's a judgment call. We have to use a lot of testing, et cetera. So I'll take some more questions from other folks. Um, we have Everett from France. I want to get the Europeans out of the way first because it's getting late there. Everett um, had a question. Let's see. Everett from France. In case there was a real leak underneath floorboards. Everything has been repaired and dried. Does the previous mold area still produce toxic fumes? That's a great question. There is research that suggests that the stachyboitrous black mold spores, even after they're dead, will release trichothecenes up for up to two years. I'm not, I'm not qualified to answer that. I've talked to a lot of scientists who deal more on the building side, 
so I don't want to tell you. One of the problems is we don't have the meters we need to measure those mycotoxins. There are meters you can handheld for benzene. Supposedly there's a company in America now that um, has a meter to measure the gas levels. I have, I was given their number by a patient. I haven't had time to call them. So I can't answer the question. I can tell you that once you have a leak, the best mold remediators in America, the best, will put plastic sheet, negative pressure, HEPA, uh, charcoal filtration. They will contain mold spores. But the gases will outgas through drywall. They will outgas through plastic. You've got to have the windows open and blow fresh air in and fresh air out. Um, and, you know, I, I just can't answer whether or not some dried out spores underneath the floor would still release toxins. But it's a great question. I'm just not the expert on that. Um, I can only tell you what I've heard. I, I only feel safe uh, when I'm outside. This particular IV therapy room, we have it sprayed every 12 weeks with, or maybe not quite as often, with a citrus spray, um, a product called TM100. It's all natural. What you do not want to do is bleach mold. If you bleach the spores, you rupture the cell wall and the toxins release in a surge. And if you do that, you've got to, you've got to have all the windows open and lots of airflow. Uh, the TM100, allegedly, and I've seen it work personally, it will encapsulate the spores, destroy the spores, but more importantly, it dissolves the VOCs, the volatile organic compounds, the gaseous metabolites produced by the molds. I'm concerned about the folks um, going back into homes after the hurricane. I wrote a piece um, that went into the Washington Post on December 26, 2012, and I pulled Suzanne Summers into it. Uh, I had just treated her granddaughter for black mold toxicity and Lyme disease and so forth, and, uh, and wrote a chapter that you guys should all read. Uh, it's on the website. <clears throat> I wrote a chapter for her in April of 2012 on how these toxins cause everything from obesity to fatigue, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but it was right after Sandy, and the point I made is that it was a wrong time of year. People go back into a home, and it's too cold in Jersey at the time to have the windows open, and they would bleach the wall. And even if you bleach the wall on this side, where the water level was six feet high or three feet high, there's black mold behind the drywall. You've got to have folks who will cut a hole, look inside the wall with a camera, et cetera. And one of the beauties of uh, the TM100 type sprays is that you do not have to microwave the books, throw away the books, throw away the clothes, the bedding, like um, folks have talked about previously. And it was necessary back in the day. But if you fumigate, if you will, the, your home, with the TM100, um, it takes care of those issues. So it's actually less expensive to um, have someone spray the spray in your home. Most important thing, guys, you've got to have a mold inspector who uses infrared cameras to find moisture behind the walls. Anyone can find mold in the room anyone can suck mold spores into a tube and have them measured in a company. If your ERMI test is negative, it means nothing. The majority of my folks don't live in a mold-infested pit. Their, their black mold is hidden behind a wall, under a windowsill, above the ceiling, somewhere. But some do. And that presents other problems. And when you imbibe massive spores, you can have excessive production of a terrible chemical called oxalic acid. It's one of the markers I use to tell women to get their breast implants out. Um, <clears throat> breast implants are very soft plastic. And when there are certain biomarkers that I evaluate, and it's based on experience and treating thousands of people, 
and or they just tell me they've been looking at mold. Um, there's a pattern if you have the right plastic surgeon who sends the breast implants to the right pathologist where they'll find biofilm that is mold, driven by mold spores just surrounding the breast implants. So you can leave a mold factory in your system, if you will. So you do breathe mold spores in through the lungs. They will cross the alveolar capillary membrane <clears throat> and deposit throughout the, the body. And there's a certain pattern we're seeing where they deposit in the frontal lobe, the mid frontal lobe, but I don't want to go there. Let's take some more questions. Um, I've got lots of questions. I'm going to try um, Jewel from Texas. We have lots of Texans. Texas is always within our top four states. Is there any way to get rid of it? My friend is living in her home, is poor, but experiencing symptoms, know where to go. Is there a way to test? Well, yeah, there's all kinds of people who can find the black mold in the room or see it in the vents. Um, and I've had people, I've told people, in fact, one of them was from Tyler, Texas. I made a move into a tent for a while to get out of the house that had leaks everywhere. Um, so Keith from Ohio, when being treated, toxins will show up in a test that show these markers. After one period of toxin release and more tests, is it common to see other toxins show up? I just explained yes. Um, there was a time when I had less knowledge and experience that when people had a negative mycotoxin test, I assumed their home was clean. I was wrong. These toxins had already moved into the fatty tissue in the body or had been sequestered as the bugs spin the biofilm. Uh, I was able to ascertain <clears throat> through my clinical research, mostly in females, we're 80% females, <clears throat> that these mycotoxins are causing MS. And what I said is they're lipophilic, Fatty and molecular structure. Give me an MS slide if you could, um, guys. <clears throat> this is very important. I said in 2009, the surge of multiple sclerosis in America. The recent, more recent surge is secondary to mycotoxins getting trapped in homes and offices. And when you breathe them in, if you do not effectively remove them through your immune system, I said they will circulate through the bloodstream for a short time and they will migrate to and deposit in the fattiest tissue, i.e. the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath, the insulation on the nerves, is 80% fatty content. And what I would see with MRI with contrast is a lot of women who had genius IQs but couldn't add 9 plus 8, if you will. They were just totally shut down in the four second processing memory in the frontal lobe, um, you could reverse that in three or four weeks if they were just toxic without biofilm. Well, you know you can't reverse the scarring in three or four weeks. It takes a long time to heal the scarring. So I said there's a midpoint where the myelin sheath is inflamed, and when it's inflamed, it shuts down the voltage. And, and now we call it lipid peroxidation. We have numbers to measure that. Um, and Florida State University proved a few years ago in their biomedical engineering lab that when the myelin is inflamed, the electromagnetic field around the nerve will change and the electricity will slow down. And this is where you see the weakness, even paralysis in the worst cases. Some patients, based on genetics, get neurogenic gastroparesis and terrific constipation. Some um, get more weakness in the lower extremities. Neuropathy which we reverse by, by mobilizing these fatty toxins out of the myelin sheath, the burning pain, which women tend to get more in the bottom of the feet as a starting point, but it will work its way up the legs. Uh, some people get it in other places. If it's bilateral, both sides, again, in my opinion, it's going to prove to be toxins. If it's unilateral, one leg, then you've got to think infection. Lyme toxins, Lyme infection. Lyme spirochetes have been isolated in the Schwann cells that make the myelin sheath. That was by University of South Dakota, <clears throat> 2011 study. But anyway, um, I said that the mycotoxins are causing MS, and I get lots of nasty emails from neurologists throughout the country. Patients wouldn't take their neurologist there, and they say, this guy's crazy. Well, 
there's a study from University of Nippon in, ja in Japan. I didn't find it until 2013, but it's a 2011 study proving exactly what I said. I said when they, when they move into the fatty acid chain, you have to understand biochemistry. A fatty toxin will move into a chain that, where there should be a good fat, an omega-3, a 6, a 9. So as the fatty toxins move into the fatty acid chain, just like to move into the fatty cell membrane, they will inflame it, and if you leave them in there long enough, you, you'll have scarring. But there's a midpoint. Radiologists will call increased T2 flare, but not white spots or bright spots. Uh, they sometimes call it T2 hyperintensity. And you want to get here early. You don't want to wait till this progresses. Um, women will tend to have bladder sphincter problems. Um, there's a company, a medical company, that now has a stimulator to help these people pee. Females will see the bladder sphincter. They have difficulty urinating often. Um, bowel incontinence, I've seen in young kids. Every one of those wheelchair pictures you stared at for an hour, every one of those patients had severe mold toxicity and then, in addition, infection. Um, so, the toxins release from biofilm, but a recent study I read just a few weeks ago, actually, the, the, it was more about petroleum chemicals, it discussed the fact, it was an ethylene oxide uh, vinyl chloride study, that when you bring down to blood level these toxins, and we, I've talked about this for years, they'll move out of the fatty tissue. So sometimes you'll see way more toxins show up the second or third round, whether they're mycotoxins or lipophilic pesticides and um, industrial toxins. Okay, one more question from Emil, and we're going to move on to some other folks. Go ahead, Emil, if you're still there. Emil? While we're waiting for her, I'm going to move on to Sandra from Colorado. Oh, Emil, are you there? All great questions. You guys have a lot of great questions. Um, are you there? Hello? Grayson, Grayson, I need you to take your medicine. Oh, I guess not. I think that's one of our mothers from Virginia. Her daughter's name is Kristen. I'm going to tease her tomorrow. All right, Sandra from Colorado, are you available? I'll go ahead and talk about your question. Um, can a Parkinsonian tremor be secondary to mold and or Lyme infection? The answer is yes and yes. In which case, if you can eradicate the infectious mold mycotoxins and Lyme co-infections, can you stop the tremor? Absolutely. I'm being told I'm in the way of the screen. Sorry. All right. So, um, yes. German scientists proved years ago the trichothecenes destroy the dopamine factories in the substantia nigra. Um, and the Japanese study that I spoke of, um, that we've had here for years, I give it to families, so they can take it home because all the neurologists are telling them there's no effect from these things. They proved that the okra toxin, the gaseous metabolite produced by penicillin and um, aspergillus molds, as well as the trichothecenes, will destroy dopamine factories within the substantia nigra, which we call the Parkinson's region. Give me some basal ganglia side view uh, or a speck even, or just a caudate PET scan um, from the ILADS, the International Lyme Conference. Take your time out. Um, what's a little bit frustrating for me <clears throat> is that there are actually three regions within the basal ganglia that are motor regions that break. If they are underactive, you have resting tremors, Parkinsonian tremors. Um, here's an example. Um, that we used. It's not the best one we have. We have much better examples, but this particular patient had black mold in her house. You see the trichothecene effect, but also we got the yellow is localized infection. She had lots of Lyme disease. This is uh, the area west 
of Philadelphia, and it's fine, don't, don't change the slide. Um, and people in this area, Westchester and beyond, they tell me they go out for a walk on Sunday and they get six ticks on them. Anyway, I would move. But the deal is the caudate nucleus is one of the three motor regions that controls fine motor. And nobody talks about it. Yet the PET scan will measure the activity in the caudate nucleus uh, and not the substantia nigra to measure the activity in the caudate nucleus and the dopamine activity. See, dopamine runs those motor regions. It's the dopamine D2 receptor, the same receptor that turns on your joy in the nucleus accumbens, your reward center. And the pandas kids, there's a couple of pandas questions. I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just going to talk about that. I have three kids here now diagnosed with pandas. Uh, I've got four that have pandas. Uh, pandas didn't exist, at least diagnostic-wise, until about 1980. Hello. The criteria put together through a consortium of universities. Uh, every one of the symptoms can come from a trico hit. Um, we've, our research has proven that trichothecine blocks the dopamine from the receptors. Um, German scientists have proven it will block the thyroid T3 receptor from the mitochondria receptor. The T3 turns on the mitochondria. Well, we'll show you later. Tyrosine, you add four iodines, it's T4. Um, L-dopa, dopamine, tyrosine, thyroid. The molecular structure is almost identical. So we didn't start with the German research. We started with our own research. Patients who release a lot of trichothecine from biofilm or just have massive trichothecine walking in the door, floating through the bloodstream, will have a shutdown of their reward center, and they will often have bilateral shutdown of the caudate nucleus. The PET scans measure glucose metabolism. Hypo is underactive. Notice this particular woman has asymmetry, so she has the left caudate nucleus is 1.36 standard deviations more underactive uh, than other women her age. The right one is 0.6 standard deviations. Uh, I've got, again, thousands, just hundreds of scans showing this. This person would have a tendency to have a resting tremor in the right arm or right hand. It's the contralateral side. Um, and you can see this is the caudate nucleus. On this particular uh, scan, the black is good, light blue is underactive, and yellow is more underactive. And this is the right caudate nucleus. Notice the yellow. Okay, good. And notice the left. There's a lot more yellow, a lot more underactivity. I prefer numbers, uh, and I use numbers all day long on these things. Uh, and by the way, the cerebellum was proven again with spec scans. That it should be a standard deviation, more active than the rest of the brain region. The majority of my patients, the cerebellum is the most shut down region. Again, the light blue. Uh, in a healthy person that doesn't have trichothecine toxicity, we have actually two in the clinic uh, that don't have trichotoxicity. And we're... Even the neuroradiologist called me, and Dr. Fabian said, wow, what's that person on your clinic? Um, so the caudate nucleus, a favorite brain region for Lyme spirochetes. Um, I was determined in, in, in uh, 2014 to plow through MRI studies from around the world. And I spent October, November, December, I went through, it was over 10,000. My office manager said 12,000, but I don't know. I kept sending these studies to them. I wanted to see the morphology, the shape of Lyme lesions in the brain versus other bacteria. The studies were done in various universities around the world where they drew spinal fluid and looked for Lyme antib antibodies. Uh, Lyme is in the spotlight, yet it's not what's killing the majority of people who come here as much as they think. It's not the biggest factor in their demise. It is in some. But... I found one Bartonella study that wiped out the left temporal lobe, um, and we see this pattern frequently in patients who have real high Bart counts. Um, <clears throat> we have a doctor's son here from South America. Um, you, there's different Bartonellas. There's, there's a more virulent Bartonella in South America. We have actually three physicians' kids uh, here. Well, we did. One went back to Virginia. But they um, will tend to have lots of trichothecine from 
hidden black mold in high schools, if not their home, and they get shut down of the caudate nucleus in the Parkinson's region. Now, the destruction of dopamine factories within the, quote, Parkinson's region, which shouldn't be called that, it's one of the three motor regions, the more underactive these regions, the less breaking you get. And we have patients that have Bartonella, it appears. Their Lyme markers are nil. They, they respond to drugs that work better for Bartonella. And yes, I use antibiotics. I didn't for years after I took over my daughter's case in 2009. But once you develop a clinic, a clinic that is saturated with neuro Lyme, neuro infected patients, you realize that an immune system that works will continue to bust these organisms out of biofilm throughout the bloodstream. There's biofilm in the gut, the biofilm in the brain, and even the parasites that most patients don't realize they have until they come here. And once their immune system begins to work the way it's supposed to, they start seeing parasites in colonics, or they see parasites in the toilet bowl. These parasites are saturated with toxins, and as they're sucking blood from the blood vessels in the intestinal wall, they're sucking Bartonella and these other infections. And I didn't get that. The toxin thing I got years ago, I'm a little slow, <laughs> and it became obvious in several patients. Uh, you always have two or three at one time, which helps you not be such a slow learner, that it's obvious that they get their symptoms or their symptoms of Bartonella infections or Lyme infections are exacerbated we give them my all-natural parasite kill, and they blow up parasites within the intestine and the bloodstream. So this caudate is underactive. Can you correct the problem? Yes and no. Can you correct it in everybody? If they stay long enough, yes. <sighs> Probably 75% of the Parkinsonian patients we've treated, we get rid of the tremors. Uh, we could probably get rid of them completely and the majority of them if they stay long enough. But if they continuously bust organisms out of biofilm, and you've got to get this concept, you have to kill them while they're swimming, which is why I moved from all natural medicine, all IV, and 90% 90, 90 of what we do is all natural. But I was wrong. It's like politics, left, right, all natural, homeopathic. That's one of the questions. Well, you go there and somebody who's busting biofilm and they're busting Bartonella, Rocky Mountain, Q fever, rabbit fever. We see it all here. It always shows up after the immune system busts the biofilm open. Those organisms travel to the brain. There is no blood-brain barrier in mold toxic individuals. There is a barrier. It's just really weak. And in kids, in Germany, they say, it's not even fully developed to age 12, they say all kids who get a Lyme infection, an injection of Lyme spirochetes, immediately get meningitis. And I've said for years, Lyme is always a brain infection. And there's all kinds of research about spirochetes screwing their way through the blood-brain barrier. They don't have to work that hard in most of my folks because the barrier is made up of a lot of fatty acids and again, destroyed. And a German study recently proved trichothesines do it, but so do the petrochemicals. So I've seen Parkinsonian tremors from petroleum chemicals shutting down the caudate nucleus. Again, uh, we have measurement of the caudate. I have a young kid in my clinic who was actually in an NIH study years ago, um, and, but no one did a PET scan, and she had a 2.28 differential her right caudate nucleus is 70% more underactive than the left, or it was when she came here. A repeat PET scan showed we're 50% back to normal. I've had patients that the caudate nuclei are shut down two standard deviations below other people their age. These numbers are based on age and sex, comparing other people. So, well, I gotta stay over here. Um, so you notice that the caudate nucleus and the cerebellum are the most shut down regions. When patients are over electrified from the shift in brain chemistry, which is the excitoneurotoxicity, and I've done over 12,000 neurotransmitter studies, and you get a down regulation of the glutamic acid decarboxylase enzyme. 
my research proved that in 2010. Remove the toxins, certain toxins, the glutamate comes down, the GABA comes up. Those people can be so over-electrified that they'll be a negative negative. But again, this cerebellum should be uh, one standard deviation more active than the most active brain region in this particular patient, which is actually her occipital association. She's an even, and again, it's confusing, a negative negative is a positive. So this cerebellum is actually three standard deviations. The right one shut down more than, than uh, it should be, and it shut down more than the left, and you see more, you, see, you can see it visually on the colors. But the numbers, of course, I prefer. So the answer is, uh, if it's simply from mycotoxins, we have to do these infusions. Again, infusing phospholipids, and we have to conjugate or grab the, the toxins as they come out of the brain. And then you can reduce the tremors tremendously very early. And if a patient becomes acutely uh, mold toxic, had a healthy immune system for years, then they don't have all this biofilm that they keep dumping toxins out of, so it's like Groundhog Week. Go, go if you would, to uh, the wheelchair pictures for two seconds. I want to cover Amy Byers. I want you guys, since those of you who have Parkinson's um, patients in the family, Go watch Amy's video. She was referred to me by the chairman or chair lady of integrative medicine at University of Kansas, uh, Jeannie Drisco, who's a brilliant physician, in 2014, and she actually was so shut down in her motor regions that she didn't walk. Massive Parkinsonian drugs, Cinemat-type drugs. Her husband carried her to the IV chairs. She decided to do the Christian thing in 2005, go down and help victims of Katrina. The problem is... Um, and she articulates it so well and learns so much of the science. You want to watch her video. It's amazing what she learned. I said, if I can get you walking, it'll take two years. She was here 14 weeks in the spring of 14, and you'll see her jogging outside of my old office. Uh, I never know. Uh, but the point is, she had no Parkinsonian symptoms, was a hotshot tennis player prior to going down to New Orleans where they decided to move these hurricane victims after Katrina into a dormitory that had been closed for 15 years. And she described black mold up and down the walls and ceilings. And what were they doing? The volunteers were bleaching the black mold. Now, if you remember, Katrina was in September. It was still very warm and hot and muggy in New Orleans. Uh, and so wrong time of year on the heat side. <laughs> So they got all these gases releasing as they bleach these spores. It took three or four weeks for Amy to start having resting Parkinsonian tremors. By the time I get her, she was like stiff. You may have a grandmother or grandfather who was in a nursing home and they give these old drugs, very strong dopamine blocking drugs. They block dopamine from the receptors and they get this rigid robot kind of walk. Well, Amy was like the nth degree of that. And in her case, we had to, if you will, we had to mobilize the trichothesines from the caudate nuclei. And she was shut down equally. And that's why it was a faster deal. Um, and she did not have biofilm that went back 20 years. And so she didn't, if you will, work against us with a healthy immune system. Uh, every one of these patients, and half of these people go public, uh, this Julia came out of a wheelchair in four weeks. I surmised after looking at over 500 biomarkers that the high school she taught in was the problem that 90% of her paralysis was trichothesine. And so four weeks, she's jogging behind her office. Go to Julia. Did she have some Lyme markers? Yeah, they just weren't significant. Um, these young kids, I treated four of them actually from British Columbia. And actually two of them couldn't walk that well, and um, they had other issues, neurogenic issues. These toxins, when they saturate the myelin sheath and they shut down the voltage, they can cause paralysis of the GI system, they can cause paralysis uh, 
of the autonomic nervous system, the whole POTS thing is the inability of the brain to respond, et cetera. I won't get into all that. There's other mechanisms. So various people here took different time based on infection level, biofilm level. Um, but the culprit, every one of these patients, uh, of course, it was black mold in the dormitory in New Orleans. The rest of these folks had black mold hidden behind a wall or visible. And uh, that was the beginning of the demise. If they're from certain areas in Ontario, uh, high petrochemicals. Go ahead. You got a question for me? Um, there's a certain area in southern Ontario, and I've spoken there. I have so many patients from that area, and uh, the bath water comes out of the lake. And, and here's the deal. There's a lot, there's so many, so much more saturation of petrotoxins in the lakes, the Great Lakes, the rivers, than we're aware of. And um, scientists just figured out a couple of years ago that measuring benzene is the wrong thing to do. They didn't know until recently that the benzene that's being measured in the air around gas wells or <clears throat> in water converts in seconds. It grabs a carbon and three hydrogens, a methyl group. It becomes methylbenzene, ethylbenzene. Uh, xylene is dimethylbenzene. So at any rate, there's a false security in the industrialized world uh, about having clean water. Now, it's much cleaner than it was maybe in the 50s and 60s. But in the 50s and 60s, we didn't have liver enzymes that were shut down from mold mycotoxins. So uh, we have a question from Lisa in Canada. And I don't know if you live in British Columbia, Ontario, but if you live uh, near southern Ontario, Hamilton, Niagara. Are you, on the, are you on Lisa? Are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, you're 905. I recognize the area code. We typically run 20% Canadians, not always. Um, wow, well, you got a lot, a lot of questions here. Um, you want to just ask me the questions I, instead of I, I can read them, but um, sure. go for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Every microorganism causes inflammation in the brain. And Bartonella is much smaller. Again, I showed you a picture of Bartonella, a tiny dot on the edge of a red cell versus a spirochete, the length of a red cell. Quite honestly, uh, this is a, quote, neuro-Lyme clinic anymore. You, the people on the phone want to get here early. Uh, I have so many women like you. Um, and I said years ago, and by 2011, on a Lyme page, there is no chronic Lyme without toxin-induced suppression of the immune system. And I'll go into detail how trichothecenes suppress the immune system in, if the toxicity is high enough, more than HIV. Different mechanisms, not just the killer cells. HIV suppresses production of the CD4 T cells. Trico suppresses production of those, as do the petrotoxins, as does ochratoxin and gliotoxin, mycotoxins, and aflatoxin. But <clears throat> trichothecine, German research, suppresses TNF alpha, the primary immune messenger, uh, primary cytokine. And when it destroys the intestinal lining, and the best research, again, is out of University of Marseille, <clears throat> it destroys the Peyer's patch. So then you don't have the antibodies. Uh, and so we have people in our clinic that, if you look at the entirety of the immune kill power, um, there's multiple factors besides T cells. At any rate, um, what about, um, go, go, well, to answer your question, anytime there's infection in the brain, yeah. the killer cells and antibodies are trying to attack the infection. The cytokines are the chemicals that draw in more white blood cells. <clears throat> the study uh, from South Dakota, you know, well, Jesus, six years ago now, 
where they isolated the spirochete in the Schwann cells that make the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. Surrounding that spirochete, it'd be the same thing in brain neurons, were all kinds of, of um, killer cells and high levels of cytokines, the chemicals that draw in more white blood cells. It's like a bee sting. You have a toxin injected, and, it, and where's the swelling come from? That toxin is a foreign body from the bee. And why does it swell? Because the cytokines are drawn to the area. They pull in more killer cells and more antibodies to remove the toxin. And that's where the swelling comes from. Well, the same thing goes on in the brain. In fact, uh, my patients can tell you I don't walk by them without looking at their pupils. We, at various points in time, have so many patients here who have pupils that are dilated to 90% of the iris. That's increased intracranial pressure. You, you know, I trained in intensive care medicine. Um, look, in the neuro ICU, you can put a screw in the head and measure ICP. Well, you can use your brain and measure it by looking at the pupils. Now, you can have increased ICP from a Chiari syndrome, which I diagnosed with a sitting MRI. <clears throat> and you can look that up, Chiari, C-H-I-A-R-I. -I. Everybody can look that up. I won't go there right now. You can have increased intracranial pressure. And many of you folks on the phone, uh, the webinar, you, you feel this pressure. You feel like your head's going to blow any time. And so the more infection you have in the brain, the more fluid and the more swelling. But you also asked, can the mold toxins cause swelling? Yes. When I talked about the myelin sheath, I don't know if you can hit that real quickly, guys. The, the myelin sheath, um, swells when, it, when these toxins inflame it. You know, years ago, I did a lot of epidural steroid injections. Most of my specialty training was oriented toward ICU versus pain as an anesthesiologist. But I did some pain work back when, before anybody even there was a specialty. But we would do epidural steroids that would make some of the sciatica pain go away. It didn't move the disc off the myelin sheath but sometimes the MRI wouldn't show that the disc was that much, uh, it, the aberrancy of the, the, the uh, geographical location, it wasn't moved over to the left or right that much, but they still had the pain, and you have to listen to the patient and inject the steroids, which it turns out probably aren't that good. It, they weaken the ligaments, but it would relieve pain because it would decrease the swelling. And those of you that have MS symptoms and pre-MS neuropathy, burning pain in your feet, can be in the legs, uh, can be in the face, but um, it's inflammation of the myelin sheath. But when those, the myelin sheath on the brain neurons, when it's inflamed, it's swollen. Does that make sense? And, and giving people epidural steroids, you know, for a sciatic pain would reduce that swelling and would actually take pressure and pain away in some patients. And I'm going back to late 80s, I hate to admit it, I'm 61 years old, but I've had more energy as a 61-year-old with my mitochondria pumped out than I had at 25, so that's okay. You know, you, you reverse aging by make, getting this gunk and junk out of the mitochondria, and that's what all the mitochondria scientists are saying. All the aging starts there. So this, this swelling alone from toxins, petrotoxins, pesticides, or mold toxins will cause increased pressure. Go ahead. vaccinations, uh, five of them within a six-month period back in 1988, 89, and really kind of went downhill after that. And then I was in Venezuela, and interesting, you mentioned the Bartonella in South America, a virulent storm. So, and I got sick when I got home from Venezuela, and within a year and a half, I was, I crashed, and I've been disabled ever since. So, if you knew... Well, I actually put out a press release on this a while back, and there were on the on an ILADS doctor's site. There were a bunch of doctors excited and lay people excited about a Lyme vaccine, and I said, "Good Lord, look! Here's the deal with vaccines: the virus is attenuated. The Lyme spirochete would be attenuated, weakened, but not dead. 
the issue with vaccines is if you if your immune system kill power again is not ceiling high but down here a foot off the floor the virus wins so would a Lyme spirochete if they start doing Lyme vaccines so uh, the press release that I put out a while back it didn't get much traction I suppose because nobody's measuring TNF alpha we found out from Quest my people have none so the bell-shaped curve moved from 1.2 to 13 down to 0.5 to one and a half I'm the number one Quest doctor in America if you're measuring TNF alpha as we do frequently everybody's down below it used to be everybody was less than 1.2 now they've changed the bell-shaped curve I didn't realize I knew that a lot of the physicians that have treated my patients weren't measuring TNF alpha but um, I didn't realize that it wasn't mentioned in a in the immunology book if you do an immunology fellowship but anyway look there's certain things one should measure before you have a vaccine whether it's a child or an adult you should know what your antibody levels are you should know what your killer cell levels are and you, you should know what the CD4 CD8 ratio is and I've correlated trichothecine levels uh, the higher the trico level the more shut down the CD4 CD8 the CD4, CD8, CD4 T cells say let's go to war, let's fight. CD8 suppressors say don't. Um, that ratio should be two and a half, three if you're infected. When it drops to 1.5, everyone who knows what it is, uh, infectious disease specialists, will assume you have HIV. Oh my God, test them for HIV. Well, I did years ago. I've never found it. I'm sure we might. Uh, but see, it's my research. Um, German scientists proved that trico, the macrocytic trichothecines and ocrotoxins and gliotoxins, those things suppress the production of the T cells. Uh, but so do the petrochemicals. That's why you have to evaluate all these numbers at one time to know which, which chemical is doing what. The Lyme spirochete, the toxin suppresses the CD57 lymphocyte. But you've got to look at the CD56 killer cells. Um, so if your CD4, CD8 ratio is below one and a half, I've got, I've got a patient sitting in front of me who came in at uh, LabCorp, would drop it all the way down. I think he was a 0.5. He said in a workshop I did recently, um, look, there, there, there's more to the immune system than the CD57 lymphocyte. People who have chronic Lyme have been just, their brain is so entrained by physicians to focus only on the CD57, it's, if it's percentile, way less than the 56s, then you probably have some Lyme toxin issues. But there's a lot more to the immune system than one or two lymphocytes. And um, so your chronic Lyme is because you had a chronic immune suppression. Uh, in South America, you have the Bartonella Quintana, which is much more prevalent. It's carried by the sand flies. It's, it's uh, all the folks that, that hike the mountains in the Andes and the, the famous um, Mach Machapuchi. I can never say it correct. My daughter's going to correct me. She did it. She climbed it last year. I wanted to kill her because I've already had everybody talk about the mosquitoes you can put a saddle on and ride home. They're almost as big as the ones in Canada. But they're injecting these things. Mosquitoes are carrying Lyme, by the way. I said it. They probably are. I think they are 10 years ago. That was proven at University of Frankfurt for all you Limeys on the phone uh, in 2015. So you've no doubt got all those vaccines. Why did you get so many vaccines in six months? I just didn't die in the know. I mean. Well, okay. well I was working um, at a hospital in housekeeping, and so to protect myself, they wanted me to have the hepatitis B vaccine. So I had two of those out of the three and had some symptoms after each Sure. Time. Was going to Venezuela um, because there was a chance of getting cholera, or yellow fever, or malaria. It was suggested we get vaccinated prior to going. So I did. Gotcha. Yeah. I have heard your story so many times. You cannot believe how many women come here after spending 25 to 30 years trying to get well and to ascertain what is causing their sickness. It's not all about mold toxins. It's all kinds of different toxins and different things. And again, it's why we look at, I don't know, it might be 550 at least biomarkers that we don't count anymore, plus blood smears. And then you correlate all that with the history. 
Um, but we got to move on to some other folks. Um, but great questions. I, I know that everyone learned from your questions and hopefully my answers. Um, and, and while we're, we got another question here, I was the infection disease nurses in the hospitals. When I was serving as a chief of anesthesiology in two different hospitals back in the early 90s, they tried to force me to get the hep B vaccine. And I didn't have the knowledge up here, but in my chest, in my heart, I knew it wasn't a good idea. And every hospital I worked in was mold in the vents, water stains, good Lord. But I, I, I always said, I had enough clout as a chief. All my anesthesiologists had to get it. I kept skating around it for years. I never got the hep B vaccine. And I believe in my heart, if I had gotten it, um, I mean, my immune system was so bad with chronic sinus infections, which are some of the questions. If you're breathing in mold spores every day, you're going to have chronic sinus infections. Um, and again, uh, the trichothecenes go right through the ethmoid sinus bone, a very thin bone in the back of your sinuses that separates the brain from the sinuses. And they begin to kill the sense of smell, olfactory cells right away. I saw a question earlier from someone about that. Um, patients come here, the ones that have been in, in, in uh, incredible black mold offices or homes, basements, and they, um, they, um, they have no sense of smell. I am so impressed. <sighs> with the healing that can occur, the neurogenesis in the brain. <clears throat> we were taught when I went to school, I graduated medical school in 1982, that you couldn't repair brain cells. God gave us 100 billion, you know, you're gonna kill a lot of them, you got a lot of buffer. Then we're taught that you can repair and have neurogenesis in the four day memory, the hippocampus, and the four second memory, the shortest memory. But we see people repairing things. You've got to get the brain back to a Garden of Eden state. You've got to get the bad stuff out, including infections and toxins, and the good stuff back in. Okay. So anyway, thank you, Lisa. Great questions. And, um, you, you know, you remind me of so many people that I'm just on my mind. I've got a question from Margie in, in Georgia. And... Um, all my Georgia folks, Margie, they've all got mold toxicity. It's just the more humidity and the higher the humidity outside, the more difficult it is to get the humidity down inside. So when you have a water leak, let's say an air conditioning pan runs over up, up above your ceiling, um, if the humidity is over 50, 55 percent in the home, millions of spores become billions, become trillions in days and they produce all this gas. Now, not all molds produce deadly gases, or so we say at this time. Uh, this particular IV room today, I had to cut it off, it got so cold, because we set this humidity at 45%. I don't want any more mold toxicity, and I don't want my patients to have it, but it, because it's running off humidity, it was down to 69 degrees. And so, um, Folks in Georgia have some of the worst mold toxicity. We love our Georgia folks. Um, and I want to tell you something. Talk about immune suppression. And Ellie had it. Look, I had a guy from um, <clears throat> Macon, 32-year-old redhead, of course, who came to me five years ago, and he had shingles five times by age 32. Is that normal? That is about a suppressed immune system. You get the herpes six chickenpox virus at age six and supposedly you should be an old man or an old woman supposedly you should have no immune system as you're older which is all bunk every decade you collect more toxins this became a theory of mine in 2009 and 10 we began to prove in 2011 you can reverse the aging process in the body and the brain by moving these bad things out and um the difference is, you come to my clinic, every adult is here for two days, and they say, oh my God, the 20-year-olds and the 25 and 30-year-olds are sicker than the 70-year-olds. And why is that? Because your daughter, you're saying, was diagnosed with pandas. She's 13. For those of you who don't know, pandas is pediatric 
autoimmune disorder associated with strep. Now they've changed the pins and they're trying to put Lyme in there and I've got a couple of those. Uh, the consortium of universities that have done a lot of research with NIH say there's two types of pandas. The streptococcal infection and the strep B13 was the one that was first isolated. If you make antibodies to that, now if your immune system is shut down, you get repeated strep infections and you're seeing a pediatrician way more often, okay. um, then you have more chance of getting pandas, but you can get one strep infection and make antibodies to the strep that end up attacking the dopamine D2 receptors that run the reward center, the nucleus accumbens. Give me a nucleus accumbens if you would, guys. Um, and um, the nucleus accumbens is your pleasure reward center. It runs on dopamine. Um, I've been talking about this guy since 2000. It's dopamine driven. You go to the next slide if you would please. Um, uh, that's not what we want. Um, but go to the next, give me a D2 receptor. It should be maybe the next one. Um, next slide. You're not in the main, you're not in the primary PowerPoint. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, go back to the, to the nucleus accumbens again. Just one before it. Um, at any rate, Margie Pandas was not a diagnosis before uh, we got airtight, energy-efficient homes. Pandas kids, there's certain criteria these universities and the National Institute of Health have come up with. Low IgG antibodies. Well, trico will cause low IgG antibodies by destroying the gut lining. Now, if you haven't read research from France, you don't have that knowledge and you pay attention to your patients, it's a classic pattern. They go through waves of agitation and depression at the same time. Well, my own research, our clinical research here has proven that trico will sit on the dopamine receptor and block the dopamine from the receptor. So, i.e., the nucleus accumbens, then back up a slide again to show folks, if you can, you should have a picture of the outside right before this one, I guess. Um, why do these kids with pandas get depression at the same time they get agitation? I explained this to the physician from Virginia who just took a, a kid home. I said, look, my research, our research, you guys have proven, um, having done 12,000 neurotransmitter levels and correlated them with trico levels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Petrochemicals and trico will shut down glutamic acid decarboxylase the enzyme that converts electrifying glutamate to calming GABA, therefore the agitation. At the same time, it will block, it will shut down the voltage in the, in the nucleus accumbens, and so you get depression um, because it's dopamine driven. Go back to the D2 slide. Um, so the same D2 receptor that runs the caudate nucleus the basal ganglia, the Parkinson's region, runs the reward center. This woman is using cocaine, which simply blocks the release of dopamine, or the recycling, if you will, the reuptake of dopamine. Electricity comes down the first brain cell. Um, the neurotransmitters are released. The dopamine molecules are supposed to hit these various receptors in different regions. And when they hit the D2 receptor, they turn on the electrical current. Okay. Pandas kids have depression because they have beat up D2 receptors. That's where everybody is focused today. So if you understand that the antibody to the strep beats up the D2 receptors, and it's not just kids, they need to get rid of the P, it's adults. So if they have a trico hit from a movie theater even, because they've got less than normal or just beat up D2 receptors so that the geometric shape of the receptor has changed. The dopamine molecule is the same, but it won't fit. The receptivity is very important, okay? So at the same time, they have a trico hit shutting down glutamic acid decarboxylase. If you can hit that quickly uh, or not, you get excess, or just stay there, that's fine. You get excessive electrical current, i.e. agitation, panic, Depending on the brain profile, which I can usually diagnose in five minutes of talking to people, if you inherit an underactive reward center, 
the DRD2 gene, you inherit less than optimal D2 receptors. I have spoken about that since 2000. The research came out in 1999 by Ken Thompson. So if you inherit less than normal D2 receptors, you're more of the quiet type. And those kids with pandas will tend to get uh, more depressed than other pandas kids because they start out with less D2 receptors within the reward center. Go back to the nucleus accumbens again. Um, so the same trichothecene hit, whether it's bust out of biofilm or it's because they go into a school, a, um, you know, Suzanne Summers' granddaughter, Violet, was talking about a, a building that they tore down with a letter I sent them. It was a temporary classroom for a French class. And you can feel your brain shut down in 15 minutes if you have the, gen the genetics that I do and you folks, the majority of you do, that you don't remove those gases right after they come in and you shut down in the four second process of memory in the temples because this runs on the D1 receptor and the prefrontal cortex is the executive center and it actually controls the release of dopamine back in the reward center so you shut down from the from the mycotoxins in the frontal lobe and this has been the, the number one cause of dementia and premature dementia we've seen in our clinic and we reverse way more dementia than we do other things people just don't brag about I had dementia last year, I was quiet at the neighborhood party, but, but now I'm talking again. In Spain, University of Madrid, they proved that the frontal lobe glutamatergic glutamate receptors or activity controls the release of dopamine back here. It's way more complicated than I'm making it, but your daughter, if she's diagnosed with pandas, will have waves of depression and waves of agitation. Tell me something, was she diagnosed after she had a strep infection? How long, my first pandas kid came from upstate New York and I, he was Rain Man and he was 18 and he was using heroin to calm overactive regions. It's not just the D2 receptor. The initial, some of the initial research talked about the serotonin receptors. Um, if you can hit me a cingulate, one of spec, my initial research on spec scans with neurotransmitter patterns going back to 2006, um, I will show you the symptoms. That kid was normal on Tuesday and on Wednesday was Rain Man. What is Rain Man? Social anxiety. You're going to go to the side view of the cingulate deep limbic. You know what I'm talking about? Just so you know. You know what I want? Beautiful, man. That's fast. Because there's 700 and some slides in here, guys. And so I'm impressed. Lyme treatment will cause this. I've got a video uh, talking about this because the SIBO and I've written chapters on it for naturopaths. Uh, certain bacteria will still trip the fan. I'm not going to get into details. Watch my public broadcast special. It's on the website. Did it several years ago. Uh, and I described the entire deal, how you become this brain versus happy brain. When this region is overactive, you worry, worry, worry. Does your daughter worry all the time? Absolutely. Okay, does she bite her fingernails? Okay, that's just one of the patterns I've picked up over the years. Uh, does she just pick, do a picking thing like this? Um, no, she just can't stop her mind. It's stuck on, it gets stuck. Well, this is this, the anterior cingulate gyrus. It's supposed to, when it's calm and normal, can you flip to a normal one? I think it's one before this. Um, this is a 2008 kid I treated that one. Is Normally it's more calm, and the way Daniel Amen said of software, uh, the red was again 35% more active. So, so when, it's, when you're overactive here, a, a calm cingulate gyrus says, move on, forgive, forget. Uh, it's a new day. But an overactive cingulate, like you've seen there in the other slides, just flip back there quickly, causes worry, stubborn, argumentative. Uh, these folks, are, it's the entire country uh, from the antibiotics. And uh, the first kid I treated, Julian, was actually using heroin to turn down the electrical voltage in this area and this area. From the deep limbic system, uh, overactive versus go back to normal, we develop the social anxiety. And if it's, if it's just severely over-electrified, even to the point of agoraphobia, and, and um, they don't want to go outside, <sighs> moody, irritable, depressed. So overactive deep limbic system causes depression. Underactive nucleus accumbens causes depression. 
go back to the other, uh, the next slide again. Um, when I did my research starting July of 06, with, I would send patients to Amen Clinic, I would do the neurotransmitter patterns, I'd look at the symptoms, I could quiet this guy back to normal by raising serotonin. And the average American took 600, not 125, not 60. Uh, some of you have genetic SNPs where you burn it twice as fast or four times faster through the monamine oxidase A enzyme. Uh, you guys have been DNA tested to death <laughs> if you've been to a lot of docs, progressive docs. But anyway, this guy would quiet. Now in a female, very important, you do not have good serotonin receptivity when estradiol is below 60 to 80 pgs per ml. So Daniel used years ago Paxil or Prozac and he would quiet these regions some. He wasn't measuring neurotransmitters and in a 2007 meeting in DC he was talking about noticing that severe premenstrual females would have this brain go to the symptoms for a moment <clears throat> four or five days before they bleed uh, overactive cingulate, worry, stubborn, argumentative, unforgiving. Guys, it's not their fault in the premenstrual period because that's the lowest estradiol output. Move to the next slide for the deep limbic system. Depression, negativity, moody, irritable, social anxiety, hopelessness, excessive guilt. The family knows more that they're easily offended, social anxiety, and moody, irritable. It's always funny to have a couple in the room and the, the husband or wife is behind the patient going, mm-hmm. Uh, this guy I couldn't quiet down and I had to read deeper, much deeper neuroscience back uh, halfway through 2006. I'm like, well, geez, um, why isn't the deep limbic calming down? And um, so why can't I get rid of these symptoms as easy as I can get rid of the symptoms of an overactive cingulate gyrus? Well, it turns out as I read deeper neuroscience, the neurons within the deep limbic system, go back to the more of a normal picture of one. Well, no, that's okay, stay here. I'm sorry, you have it. We've redone these 18 times. We're not sure how to teach all this. But when you, the more calm this deep limbic system is, it's normally an oval-sized region in the midbrain. You women have a larger deep limbic system, and it's more active. You're supposed to be more emotional. That's the way God made you. It's not a fault. You're supposed to be more sensitive. Now, a man who is on fire here because he has no serotonin, no taurine, will be more sensitive than a woman uh, and more easily offended, etc. The What I was able to figure out is these are GABAergic nerves. GABA does not have receptivity on brain receptors, good receptivity, without an essential amino acid taurine. Okay? So, your daughter... Was it one day, you said, or a week later? How long did it take you to notice the difference after the strep infection? Um, she had strep like six times in a year, but then it, the sudden onset of OCD was like immediate. Yeah. In a day, she changed. Wow. Minutes. Yeah, I've heard that. And we were also in a moldy house, and we didn't realize that until a year after the pandemic diagnosis. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've just seen this story thousands of times. Um, you said you were in a moldy house, so you saw mold, and you really have no idea how much hidden mold there was, probably. Did, um, are you in the same house? We, did, we didn't see any, but we did an ERMI test, and it was extremely toxic, so okay. we left a year and a half ago. Okay. Um, but it was very toxic. And, and here's something I teach. We did not learn this in our training. <clears throat> I've asked several of the physicians that cover me and so forth, and one of them is a Harvard-trained ER doctor. We did not learn that the liver doesn't mature in detox capability till age 13. So you can be in the same house and your liver is mature in detox capability, but a seven-year-old would detox half of the toxins, whether it's trico, okra toxin, mold toxins, petrotoxins, as a 13-year-old. So the children in your homes, folks, are way more toxic than you are um, and after looking at the, how many of you, I wish I could see all your faces, can they raise their hands on your screen? How, how many of you had a baby that was born with idiopathic jaundice? It'll take a little while, but we'll, we'll, we'll tabulate it. If I have 40 families in a workshop, 
at least four or five will raise their hand. And once I saw the Texas Tech research and how toxic trico definitely is to the liver, I surmised that the majority of the idiopathic jaundice is because the, these tr the trichothecine that shuts down the liver uh, causes jaundice. Six people. Uh, was your daughter jaundice at birth? Yes. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> the Japanese neuroscientists proved in rat brains what I've been saying in hu about human brains for years, and they even proved more damage from these mycotoxins. Um, the trichothecine floats around your bloodstream, dear, but you could, you could detox it way more effectively than your fetus. The fetal liver detoxes nothing, something else you have to learn. The fetal liver detoxes nothing until the cord is cut. Now, so you got a, a trichothecine toxic mother, can be petrotoxic, and she's not jaundice, but when the trico crosses the placenta, I think this is hitting, I can feel, um, this is really tugging at some hearts. <clears throat> if you just think these things through, the baby can't detox the trico. The jaundice is a bilirubin. They're in liver failure. Mm -hmm. And nobody gets it. Okay? Well, we don't need this right now. I guess we do. Um, so, how many days was your baby jaundice? Probably a week and a half. Wow. Because people say four days. Uh, the other six people who raised their hands, Doug, just have them email you how many days their baby was jaundice. Idiopathic, we were taught to sound intelligent when we know nothing. Idiopathic, it means we have no clue, we're clueless. Um, and so it's all over the country. I had an ICU nurse come to join our IV room in 2013, and the second baby was born jaundice. And the baby was born, they said, with autism. And it wasn't like, got, a lot of kids will get the autistic stuff, uh, they get more of this brain moves to this brain, the more antibiotics they get from the pediatrician because they can't kill the strep like the other kids in school. And they acquire the rain man, if you will, or rain, whatever, symptoms, these symptoms. Uh, they acquire them over time. Your daughter had the acute hit, the OCD you noticed first, and I've seen all kinds of different, there's all kinds of OCD symptoms, washing hands, blowing on hands, various things. But if you understand uh, the deeper neurochemistry and physiology of the brain, you can understand what's going on. Um, what, there's some other patients, uh, apparently, who have called in about pandas. <sighs> what treatment has she had so far? She had, this started when she was 10, and she had antibiotics, which helped initially, but then it stopped and IVIG for six months, but that didn't work. And the only thing that helped is when we left the house and she did homeopathic. Mm -hmm. That's helped her a lot, but her complement C4A is still like 19,000 and shouldn't be above 650, and she's still having a lot of issues. Yeah, and that's an indirect way of, of, of figuring out what's going on. It's, it came from some original work <clears throat> by Richie. It's good, it's fine. Uh, it, it tells you she's still saturated. Look, here's the deal. You've got to get the t these toxins out of her brain. Now, let me explain something I failed to explain earlier on the caudate nucleus. A study came out a couple years ago. I mean, I read 50 hours a week some weeks. You have to with brain science. It, it, it's, the knowledge is exploding exponentially, and basic medical knowledge doubles every year. It has since 2005, but here's the deal. The caudate nucleus of those three motor regions is not simply a braking region. Turns out it's a relay center. Um, so give me, um, go back to the original healthy um, brain, bigger picture if you would, two or three slides back. There you go. Here we go. These basal ganglia, left and right, front of the brain back, again, left and right, the substantia nigra Parkinson's region, caudate nucleus, and lentiform nucleus, all three are in those regions. The caudate nucleus, it turns out, is not simply a braking region, and it gives you control for fine motor. And just something I love uh, picking up patterns. Piano players, fine motor. The most overactive brain region they'll have is um, 
the caudate nuclei. In fact, you'll see a video of a girl named Taya who actually had such wild seizures, she broke 14 of our chairs, I think. But you see a video of her skating like a professional hockey skater. She's a Canadian, we love our Canadians, but they come in for some sick, really sick patients. She's doing wonderful now, rock climbing and skating. But this girl, her caudate nuclei were way overactive, and I told her mother, I said, she played a lot of piano before she got sick. And it's just a pattern, fine motor. But this caudate is a relay center from the midbrain out to the frontal lobe. And when one side or both are underactive, it can cause OCD. So beyond that anterior cingulate gyrus being overactive causing OCD, an underactive caudate nucleus can cause OCD. Are you still with me, Margie? Yes, I am. And the reason she got better with antibiotics, I said it earlier, I'll say it again for the folks on the webinar. The research I went through, MRI research, thousands of scans, and my own research with PET scans, have proven that spirochetes love the caudate nucleus, but we actually uh, find that at least 50% of our patients, low Lyme markers are no Lyme Bartonella. Bartonella loves the caudate, and that South American Bartonella, back to um, the previous patient, the Quintana is, is more virulent, supposedly tougher to kill than the Hensley we have. And there's a lot of different Barts. Um, there's a Duke study proving cats have way more BART. I haven't seen the study. One of the physicians who had his kid here was speaking to the chairman of veterinary medicine. Supposedly a thousand times more BART now on cats than any other animal. And there's a pattern. I have all these good sold women who have no immune system and are always doing cat rescue. You have cats in your house, Margie? Yes, yes we do. I don't hate cats. It's a joke around here. I hate the fact that they breed Toxo and they told you guys when you're pregnant, don't lean over to cat poop. A kid that's got no immune system like your daughter has no business being around cat litter and the bark is shed from the fur. And supposedly, I didn't see the study, I took the word of this physician from Virginia who wouldn't make it up, he actually called this chairman of veterinary medicine at Duke, right in the middle of my IV room uh, a few weeks ago, and every animal in the house will pick up the BART, and I think that includes humans. They weren't talking about humans, but we have more BART brain than we do Lyme brain. Uh, and the worst shutdown we've seen of the caudate nucleus on PET scans, where you can measure the activity, has been in BART and patients. They don't have a little Parkinsonian thing, they go like this. Okay, so Margie, what are your questions? I can tell you the antibiotics you used probably increased the electrical activity in the caudate nucleus. You saw the antibiotics reduce the OCD, correct? Correct, at oh. first. At first, until the Lyme that you didn't kill, especially what was already in her biofilm, because this kid has had no immune system. She was born jaundice. She had no immune system. You said seven days, the average woman says four days. The ICU nurse who came here and said, geez, I'm an autistic expert. She'd been to every autistic meeting in the country and thought it was about Lyme. And I said, stop. Because she said, this first son always has autism if it's Lyme from the womb, not the second son. I said, stop, there's all these myths, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I said, you hear all this stuff. I said, here's what happened, autistic from birth, how many days was your son in the neonatal unit with jaundice? Well, how'd you know? I said, just answer the question. I thought she'd say seven days like you or 10. She said 44 days. That's some severe liver failure. And that kid spoke more after we did some glutathione two days than he had in five years. Um, I said, what you did is you moved from a newer hospital to an older hospital or from a newer condo, two bedroom, now you need three bedrooms, one or the other, and she said, we did both, and she moved from the newest hospital in the county to the oldest, and she moved from a five-year-old condo development to a 50 or 60-year-old Florida house. Go figure. Correlates, doesn't it? By the way, bedwetting kids are trichothecine toxic to prove otherwise. Uh, it destroys the cells that make the ADH hormone. So, uh, your daughter needs more work if you want to do some testing. 
uh, she's young, you want to get her. The longer you let this go, the, all these spirochetes, Bartonella, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera they keep having babies, you understand that, all right? So, um, you want to come down here and talk to some folks? There's a couple of Pandas kids here. Listen, thank you, Margie. You're close enough to drive down. Call the office, find out when I do my next workshop, and meet, meet a lot of the folks uh, here. Everyone in this IV room, whether they're from England, uh, Canada, or Los Angeles, they will talk to you. The majority sign off on their HIPAA so we can talk to them. Some days I have to move through this room like I would an ICU and treat multiple things. You can't take people into a closet every five minutes to ask questions. And what warms my heart is they all become a big family. Um, all right, I'm going to move on. Thank you, Margie. You're, Thank you. you. You can drive here and come down and learn some more. Carol Moore, are you on the phone? Is she, I hear Carol is on. I, Carol is one of my favorite patients. I love all of you. We have treated 24 or 27 people in her family. Are you there, Carol? Not yet. Not yet. We'll give her some time. Um, Carol came to me in 2013 and brought sisters and brothers from Pittsburgh. She lives in Naples. We treated a lot of the children, the nieces, the nephews, and um, uh, just a wonderful family. <clears throat> and uh, one of her relatives had a high school and that was had had mold issues. But look. You can hardly find a building that doesn't have a problem. Carol, are you there? Can you hear me, Doc? I can certainly hear you. Hey, I give you a hug through the uh, computer. <laughs> Back at you. <laughs> I have to thank for the amazing health of my family. I just want to thank you. Um, but unfortunately, I haven't been back in two years because I need to stop in once in a while because I have those bad genes that make all the mold gather in my head. Yeah. And so the frontal lobe shuts down and... You know, I'm trying to grab those words, and I just need to get in there for a couple weeks. But yeah. in the meantime, what can I do to try to, you know, uh, get some clarity in this brain of mine? Um, well, you could do some oral. You know, I like the Essential Pro. Uh, there's all kinds of glutathione. If it's lipophilic, it will work. Um, you know, that frontal lobe is a dopamine-driven animal. Um, and that four-second memory runs on the D1 dopamine receptor. And so you, you can't escape going into the stores in Florida. You look up, you see black mold and vents, and you know, so you can't escape trico. Try to bring down the blood level and maybe do some colonics to accelerate removal. Um, okay. If you can get some basic IV glutathione drips down there, uh, you probably can at Pearl Nutter Center. <clears throat> to really pump the frontal lobe out, you know, we got to do my fancier deal, but, um, you know, uh, you're really busy. You're tied up with some family. I think you can't get up here. Is that, is yeah, that what? Yeah, I'm taking care of my 92-year-old mother now. Oh, goodness. Well, that's, t that's the be most important She's job. Right, I can She's probably, be. once you bring her with you, I, I can probably open up your frontal lobe in three days. Uh, we don't have to kill a lot of infection like we did back in 13 and all your relatives and everybody. Um, no, because I'm really healthy. I never get sick. I never get sick. Yeah. Like a, but, but I'm very, very, very sensitive to mold. It's Absolutely. Like mold. I can tell exactly. Even if you can't smell it, I can tell. It, well, it's amazing how most of us, when, when we had our antibodies shut down, the mitochondria shut down, our antibodies were too sluggish to react to the spores. And so you're way more sensitive to mold spores and or the toxins, any of the foreign bodies that come in the bloodstream and or petrotoxins uh, than you are when you first come here. Every, you, everybody notices that, you know? So yes, yeah, your immune system is much stronger even though you're slowly shutting down. Uh, you're so intelligent though, you can always drop a couple, 20 or 30 IQ points and still be the smartest woman in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's all in a fog up there trying to get that word. Well, I mean, if you could just get up here for a few days, uh, I know your yeah. brain. <laughs> I know the brain. Did we treat 24 people in your family total, I think? Maybe, I think 26 maybe. Uh, maybe it is 26. Um, she's got the most gorgeous children. 
And I guess the last one I saw, your daughter came by and changed her oil, so they say, didn't she, recently? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what the guys call it. I'm coming in, Doc, to change my oil uh, twice a year. Most of our patients try to come back for a week, uh, twice a year, and we can, as I say, quote, pump and dump and wake things up. Um, when you've already killed a bunch of infection that people had harboring for years, uh, you don't have to go back and do that. And then you become more of a person who just got acutely mold toxic because of a flood. And I guess that last hurricane, did it hit you guys pretty hard down there in Naples? Yeah, we had two, two, yeah, I can't keep my mom in her house, so she's moved in with us. Oh, well, boy, you had a lot of water leaks. Well, the, 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 I need to come in and blow the sink off, that's what I You You do, and you need to get your neighbors to have water damage. Look, they need to get in early and get it out, and then before they shut down the immune system for a period of time. The folks in Naples who had a healthy immune system prior to the hurricane, but won't now, you, you don't want to have two years of biofilm bug buildup. So, you know, if they get here early after the hurricane and water damage, whatever, uh, and they really were healthy prior to that, you probably have some friends that are already noticing they can't think as well uh, is that the case? Have you noticed that in some of your friends that it have water damage? Oh, yeah, but, you know, nobody likes to admit it. I know. They don't want to admit it. You've got mold. Everybody's a mold denier. I know. I know. It's better than it used to be. Uh, but anyway, well, tell your family hello. And um, I always like to joke about her daughter. She, her, her daughter had... Can I help you? You remember when your daughter told me, I said, do you have cats? And she says, No. And that was her answer, because she was only like 15 or 14. And it's just like a cute answer from a teenager. And you smacked her on the shoulder, I mean, nicely. I mean, this woman loves her children. You have how many, 18? Just teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few. But you said, you played with six cats a day for four hours a day or whatever out in the barn for years. And it's so funny. Uh, if you weren't there, the answer was, no, never had a cat, never been around a cat. But um, I know, I, I just saw her. She looks phenomenal. She's starting college now, I believe, right? Oh, yeah, she's in the middle of it. She Is she really? I, you know, I'm sorry. Time flies when you get to be old, right? Wow. But uh, it's always great to hear from you. And get up here. Bring your mother. Maybe, maybe we'll just pump her out. All right? Okay. It's always good to hear from you, Carol. And tell everybody I said hello. God bless. Thanks for the seminar. It's great. Oh, thank you. Uh, Lisa is on the phone from South Dakota. Hello. Hey, Lisa. Hi. How are you? Well, we're doing really great. Thank you. Um, Lisa came here earlier in the spring. A typical pattern is mothers come and then they realize, wow, my, my children have issues. And then you brought your three children. And what a beautiful family you have. Um, but, but, you know, you learn, I mean, you knew you had Lyme disease, I suppose, when you came, like most people. Yes, we did have that uh, that's what diagnosed uh, up in, in, in Wyoming at the time when we lived there, yes. Yeah, and then people learned about the toxins and, and um, fracking in South Dakota, fracking in Alberta is, is causing a lot more petrotoxicity uh, than people realize. Uh, but anyway, everybody's doing pretty well. I suppose. Yes. Yeah, so we did. Um, we when we when we landed after our time down in uh, Florida, we landed back home. Definitely, there was an adjustment period, and um, we took a tour of Jenna's high school. Oh boy. And, uh, yes. Uh, just in that hour and a half that we were uh, walking through the school, she started having some muscle twitching and headache. And uh, we knew at that point that she was not going to be able to go to high school. So we, uh, in, you know, in, in the building. So we scrambled and uh, got her uh, set up with the homeschool system. But uh, which, you know, and um, was hard because after being down <clears throat> with you and having these toxins pulled out of her brain, she lost her anxiety, her social anxiety. She wanted to be around people. And then all of a sudden we had to pull her away from her peers 
and you know homeschooler so um you know there's some emotional adjustment there but we thought well there's other ways that she can be around people and and uh, being homeschooled she could certainly um you know have a, a job during the daytime um and what we're finding out after our final uh testing urine testing on the mycotoxins that well she got a job at a place that uh showed her um i think we said what 900 times she was 902 uh, times uh, <clears throat> a recent mycotoxin test that was done uh, a month or so ago <clears throat> she came back 902 times the government set toxic level on <clears throat> one of the macrocytic trichothecenes and um, it was the school and and it's always the schools guys they cut the air off in the summer but but you think the place she went to work as well yes that's i mean because she was only in the school for an hour and a half i mean and then we we just said yes yeah, she wow. cannot go to the school um and uh anyway so the only two places that she spent any time were home and at her work and since um all <clears throat> All, myself and the kids all took the urine test at the same time. Um, myself and the other child didn't show any. No trico. Right, I know. No. So that would just, that, that's kind of what we deducted. Absolutely. Thinking, well, that's where she's got to have gotten it. So she put in her notice <laughs> and uh, she's like, Mom, I'm going to have to bum money off you now for gas money, but um, I'd rather have her do that and be healthy. Yes, and she's 17, as I recall, uh, 16, 16. Yes. and you know, it is a tough age for them to leave school, but my daughter was sick, and we had to pour out of school with her sophomore year, then when she, you know, I took over her care after two years with another ILADS doctor, and when we got her better, she could have gone back her senior year, but by that time, she'd been out for two years, homeschooled, and um, they can always have the friends over to your home. Yes. And they need to, they need to hang out at your home versus the friend's home because you've probably had the Mold Matters guys treat your home or at least check it, I guess. And uh, we have them travel the country. It's, uh, you got to be careful where your kids hang out, but um, God bless her. And she's so sweet. It's, isn't it sad, folks, that you, you take a job in a restaurant, you, no matter where you go, you run into, run into these problems, and, and um, but you, you come here, you learn, and you become hypervigilant, and uh, thank God you took a tour of the high school, and, um, and then you, 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 did, you, you did, you used your brain, deductive reasoning, and I'd like to think I made it work better than it did when you came. thinking my brain and a lot of emotional aspects of things before I found you and um, I knew that Lyme had to have something going on with the brain because those were my symptoms was really the brain I didn't have the achiness I didn't have a lot of um, you know physical physical stuff um, that I know a lot of the people I met when I was down there had had um, and when I researched you and looked at all your brain work, that's when I knew I found the right place. And I, you know, um, just have to tell you that first and foremost, I am back who I used to be. I am fun. I love life again. I'm bright and happy. And I wasn't like that for about 10 years. And the kids have their mom back, but mostly my husband has his wife and we owe that to your dedication and what you have done through so many years of your own research and reading others' research and implementing them into the clinic there. So, I mean, it's, after 25 years of marriage, I, I can only look forward to another, you know, 25 years of just so much, uh, better relationship, so I just thank you for that. Well, you're welcome. You guys, um, you know, I told you when you left, we'd all, we'd all go into the depression. My staff, um, you've got great kids. You, you, 
just send us more families like you guys. Um, you're so appreciative, and uh, it's a lot of fun. It's and you know you talk about reversing brain age and body age. I mean, you've experienced it, <clears throat> and um, you know, we get better at it each year. I keep, I continue to advance our treatment, but I mean, you looked at least 10 years younger, maybe more, I don't know. Um, and, but what's more important is, is feeling 10 years younger. I mean, it, plastic surgery can make you look younger, but you still feel like crap, right? Um, right. So, yeah, it's great. You know, when you, when you talk about the mitochondrial and, and the healing that happens, especially after the immunity gets <clears throat> back up, which we know happened for myself and the kids. Sure. As I'm home, as the weeks went by, because I think our last time uh, was August 21st is when we left the clinic, it's, it's my mind is getting clearer. My word finding is so much more <clears throat> so, I mean, and, and memory and things are still, as I'm even just away, are still getting better and healing. I'm glad you mentioned that. Something I should explain. We talked about inflammation in the brain <clears throat> earlier and brain swelling. And something I say in the workshops, but don't have forgotten to say tonight, is that um, I always say there's no healing with the killing. It's a necessary evil. Uh, but we used to kill, 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 like a lot of Lyme physicians, and just make the brain more toxic and say, well, why aren't you better? Um, now we, we work, I mean, sometimes you get five infusions a day here. People don't understand. <laughs> You're getting three weeks worth of treatment here in four days compared to other places. I mean, how many days did you have four or five different infusions to do different things? Um, exactly. Come in in the morning and then yeah. have that break and come in in the afternoon yeah. to finish up some extra, yes. But the thing is, is uh, even though we now can move the, the um, bacterial toxins out of the brain very effectively and all the petroleum and mycotoxins, so we don't have people leaving with that brain dead deal. Here's the, the, the deal is, I cannot reduce the inflammation right away. Typically, um, if the people will stay and finish the job pretty much, you don't have to get through all the biofilm. People that leave early, they'll smear you on the internet and say you made them worse. If your immune system is activated and you leave in the middle of that um, and it won't back off of the biofilm that's saturated with ugly toxins, they feel worse. Um, because the toxins within the biofilm, like the bugs, aren't affecting anything. I, I despise the biofilm. It's a dream to have people who don't have it, but you left at appropriate time, and what you're seeing each week, and it takes about 12 weeks, that's just based on talking to people and follow-up, for the brain and the body to slowly have less inflammation. Uh, because once you stop attacking foreign bodies, bugs, toxins, you still have elevated immunity and more inflammation. And we use a lot of herbals. We, we do, what, 90% natural. I just learned uh, that I should use antibiotics in some people, neurological symptoms. Um, and I could show you Bradley from Australia before and after brain scan, PET scan, and he, he wouldn't let me use antibiotics. And I said, Bradley, <clears throat> You can grab that scan, I'll talk about it. If you don't let me use antibiotics, the lime that's busting out of your biofilm formations throughout the bloodstream, some of them are going to hit the brain in other regions. And um, so, you know, we, we do that. But, you know, resveratrol, curcumin, I mean, there's all kinds of anti inflammatory herbals. And the more of those you use, the, the better. We used to give people way more herbs, and that's just sometimes. You can't even tolerate all that. You know, your job's busy enough. But um, I would put everybody on resveratrol, the curcumin at least, and uh, make sure we keep that DHEA hormone optimal for each child and yourself. It's the strongest anti-inflammatory hormone. Uh, that's why they call it the grace hormone in Europe. And uh, there's also six times more DHEA in brain tissue, folks, than there is any other hormone. Um, Bradley came to us. Uh, oh, anyway, thank you for coming on. Do you have any questions, Lisa? Well, actually, I have a question. Um, I'm 
actually I do and that is mm -hmm. it is concerning Jenna with her hit uh, mm -hmm. and the, you know the probably s eight weeks that she worked yeah. there um, what because uh, we've definitely <coughs> up her glutathione yeah. <clears throat> and we, we did do some uh, the activated charcoal. Doc, can you tell me what else? Um, <clears throat> well, I don't want her yeah. <clears throat> and the reason I'm not saying cholestyramine, you know, um, <clears throat> it's an old cholesterol drug. The myelin sheaf is under attack. I said it in 2009, proven in 2011 by neuroscientists and rat brains. Mycotoxins and trichos causing the MS, and the myelin sheaf is 25% cholesterol, folks. So, I don't recommend the cholestyramine. It, her level, as I recall, in that one trico was 141, and the government set toxic level was 0.5, and the bell shaped curve took the 1.2. I would just um, can you get the colonics where you're at in Wyoming? Um, eight hours away. Wow. Um, <clears throat> well, you could do some enemas. They don't go that far up the colon, but, you know, I taught you here, even if we use l higher doses of glutathione to grab higher levels of toxins, you pull them down to the liver, gut, you don't, they recirculate if you don't get them out. Um, right. I have found the Essential Pro. Uh, I don't leave home without it. Um, I... I would advise her at that level, that 141 that I saw, I would <clears throat> have her take 10, 10, and 10, okay. and ha she doesn't really need the enemas. She's probably not going to want to do them anyway. Um, <laughs> I mean, she's a 16-year-old cutie pie. I, I would, um, the, the uh, zeolite I found works well for the lipophilic toxins and the charcoal. Probably you don't have everything, just probably raise the Essential Pro higher for two weeks, or, in, or even a week, and let's repeat it. Let's, re let's have her do a urine, call the girls upstairs and have them <clears throat> send you some kits, because uh, that is a very deadly level, but we believe based on the story, it's acute exposure. Her liver works way better now than it did when she came, um, and she won't have the petro exposure that she had from the fracking, so you know, we're dealing just with this one toxin from a restaurant or wherever she was working. Good God. Uh, isn't it sad that you can get that much uh, trico? And that's those of us folks with this gene. I would just go, if, if I were in your situation, in your geographical location, <clears throat> I, would, um, I would take her to 10, 10, and 10, even for a week, and then we can repeat. Um, okay. But I can also give you a call tomorrow. I've got a couple other ideas. Great. That we'll talk about just the two of us. Okay? All right. Well, listen, I appreciate it and thank you so much for the webinar. I, I've got a lot of people watching, so hopefully they'll get the teaching as well. Well, hopefully. Um, give everyone a hug for me, will you? I'll do that. Thanks, Doc. Take care, Lisa. Bye bye. All right. <clears throat> okay, Scott from Minnesota. Bring him on. Hey, Doc, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Um, I, uh, Do you remember, remember me? Well, I have a lot of Minnesota patients. Hang on a second. Oh, time out. You brought me your wife. Yeah, I was your best friend. You were my comedian. You made me laugh. You were my stand-up comedian. How are you, Scott? I'm doing good. Your wife, you guys were here in 2015, correct? <clears throat> yeah, your memory's good, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, I try to keep my four second and four day memory pumped out. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, up here. yeah, well, in Minnesota, let's, let's articulate it like a Minis in Minnesota, right? You guys articulate so well. We Southerners just don't move that tongue. It's always the basement in Minnesota, folks. What's your question, yeah, Scott? You always have a lot of brilliant. Is, Anna's, uh, she's been getting a little worse lately. I no, actually, I asked um, <clears throat> Great Plains to do mycotoxin testing two years ago, 
<clears throat> and we recently got it. You know, my favorite test was the organic acid test. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they're using mass spec, mass spectrometry. That's what we use in the operating room to measure gases. And so, um, if you think it's where you're living, I would have her um, call down and we'll they'll ship some kits up there uh, and have her, you know, may as well ship two or three at a time. Um, and have her do the, the test. <clears throat> and for you folks on the phone, I mean, if you're really in a bad way, we, I, I'll look at these tests and tell you what I'm thinking. Uh, again, you got to remember, Scott, and you learned that well. When you guys were here, I was advancing that technique on myself, if you remember, um, increasing phospholipid therapy to see what it really takes to empty the intracellular level. <clears throat> and, um, at any rate, there's no doubt that she's probably got some more exposure. Um, and just let's get her tested. We, um, when you guys were here, we didn't have nearly as good of a petroleum toxin test either. Um, the petrotoxin test that measures pesticides as well, um, it's from Great Plains. And I always want both of them together. And, um, you know, it, it adds a lot of numbers, and you know how I like to compare all those numbers. So I'd, I'd suggest that you have Janice do both, okay? So, okay, so. Um, and you know, at the same time, um, you know what? Um, why don't you call in tomorrow and talk to LaTanya, and I will tell her exactly what to send you. We probably should email you some blood work. You know, I like to correlate all those other numbers and the hormones, et cetera, and immune kill markers, uh, all those mathematical biomarkers at the same time. And, um, you know, she, you got Blue Cross or something for that blood work. And um, mm -hmm. Quest or LabCorp, whichever one your insurance pays for. Um, we should look at all that at one time. Okay. Because, you know, I like to correlate those things and look at liver okay. function and pituitary function and GFR, kidney function, et cetera. So, yeah, the, the, uh, the test we use for uh, petro pesticides, my golly, it, um, it used to cost two, three thousand dollars to measure pesticides in folks. So and we did it in the folks who sprayed them. And this test will cover 163 pesticides in addition to all kinds of benzene derivatives. And um, when you guys were here, that test had not come out yet. So, uh, and of course, it took about 12 weeks for my patients to blow the bell-shaped curve like they did on all the other tests. Isn't that something? I mean, we got the most toxic people in the world. It's, uh, it's a joke. Uh, yeah, I've spoken at four meetings since July. And when I show some of the, our record-breaking people and the level, they're like, where do you find these people? And it's like, well, they eventually find us. But uh, great test. Um, you guys, I don't know if your bath water comes out of the Mississippi. You kind of live west of Minneapolis, don't you? Uh, no, we're east. We're over by the river. OK, well, then you probably have your city water coming out of the river. Um, downstream watershed, more heavy metals and more toxins. But uh, look, you remember these lipophilic fatty Industrial toxins go right through the skin. So you get more bathing or showering than you do uh, drinking. And that's why people think they're safe with charcoal filtration on the drinking water. And if you live in certain cities, you need charcoal filtration on the entire water system. Um, so uh, call in tomorrow and um, <clears throat> talk to Latanya and have her come to me. And I will give her a list of things to send up your way. Okay? All right, well, good yes, to thank you so much. Take care. I miss you guys down there. All right, I miss, we miss you too. Come visit us. <clears throat> All right. Uh, Valerie, Valerie from Florida, are you there? Can you do me a favor. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm going to explain Brad, what we're waiting for her. Bradley came to me at age 23 from Australia. He lived on a dairy farm. He didn't have petrotoxicity way out in the country. Um, his accent was so heavy, I made him 
every time he passed, he'd say, that's not a knife. And he dressed up in Halloween as uh, Crocodile Dundee, but a sweet kid who had ticks like this for, I think it was 20 years. And um, so cute, once we killed all this Lyme infection deep in the cerebellum, uh, the ticks were gone, and he could drive a car. Didn't have a driver's license in Australia, but he drove one here, kind of cute. And started dating one of my patients from Alabama. I thought that was kind of cute. Caught him going to a movie theater one Friday night, and I'm leaving about 8 o'clock, and I said, no. We're in a movie. You stay in one of my condos because we have them treated. Anyway, so I said, Bradley, uh, just, just pumping out the mitochondria, waking up his brain, getting rid of the, the mold toxins. Uh, you see the trico effect again, the blue, and no immune system for years. Uh, we get rid of the ticks, but I said, Bradley, four years ago, I wouldn't have used antibiotics because I was so turned off by some treatment my daughter got where the antibiotics really put her, made her bedridden and gave her panic disorder and, and all so forth. It's all on the website. You can read the testimony. But I said, if we don't, what I have learned, I was wrong. What I've learned is if you have a lot of biofilm bugs release, you want to kill them, quote, while they're swimming is Vinny, one of my husbands from Chicago, would walk around the clinic saying a year ago. And I said, you're going to pick up spirochetes somewhere else in the brain. And by golly, he did. Notice how much more underactive this, ye more yellow in the frontal lobe. And Lyme spirochetes love the prefrontal cortex. This is an inferior view of the brain. I'm sorry, I get so accustomed to this. We're looking at the bottom of the brain. These underactivity... But see how the cerebellum, and he had, I don't know how much increased activity in the cerebellum. Was it calculated on Bradley? Um, we have this on a lot of people. But anyway, the point I wanted to make is he picked up infection, more infection in the right. This is the right and left, if you look at the bottom of the brain. The right, four-second learning processing memory. Your shortest short-term memory. Lyme spirochetes love that region. And... Um, so then the last week he was here, the last week of his visa, uh, he said, well, okay, doc, you can use some <laughs> antibiotics. So we used a couple of days. He still, he killed all this infection and lost his ticks of 20 years without using antibiotics. Because I saw a few questions, are we all natural? Look, again, I, everything we do is 90% natural. But until you treat lots of neuro Lyme, neuro BART, neuro Rocky, neuro Q fever, rabbit fever, look, some of our kids have, once they bust biofilm, they'll test positive, particularly the northeast quarter from Boston down. They'll, they'll test positive for Q fever, rabbit fever, brucellosis back in America. I think half of the cases I presented at ILADS uh, had brucellosis, which is supposed to be eradicated from America. If you have lots of joint pain, not tendon pain, tendon pain back in the back of your neck is more likely BART, but joint pain in the neck and the spine is brucellosis to proven otherwise. And the majority of my Europeans have brucellosis from eating unpasteurized goat cheese. A pearl for all of you, do not eat unpasteurized goat cheese. I live on goat cheese. It's a joke among my staff. And I drink goat milk and honey with my coffee, but don't eat unpasteurized goat cheese. Brucellosis. They call it Malta fever in Europe. It's so common. And my American businessmen and women who travel Europe tend to have brucellosis because they serve unpasteurized goat cheese at so many of the dinners. Just a little pearl for you. At any rate, uh, so, you know, people want to say, oh, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Judgment is what's lacking. Common sense is what's lacking. Lisa talked about deductive reasoning. Um, you have to, uh, did we kill all this and get rid of the ticks without any antibiotics? Yes. But the same kill power we gave him through all natural intravenous techniques and oral supplements, etc., that killed all that infection did not kill some of the spirochetes, we'll assume, that he picked up here, the yellow area. Classic. So, you know, um, I can do it all natural. Um, but if you have neurological symptoms, brain symptoms, I think it's malpractice 
I would not have said that four or five years ago. You don't know until you've done the brain scan research I've done. We've got the largest PET scan study in the world on Lyme disease patients and mold toxic patients. There's a professor at Harvard who started last year. She had, uh, I heard from one of my Boston patients, they got a $2 million grant from a wealthy family. I don't know how many she's done. I'm going to try to connect with her. I've got lots of before and afters and all kinds of infectious biomarkers and other markers to prove what's going on. And I'd love to publish with her. But um, <clears throat> at any rate, so to answer your question, we decide based on your symptoms and based on your PET scan. I'm at the point now where I would determine the priority of treatment more based on the, your PET scan than I will infectious markers. The best test in the world to test for antibodies to BART, Lyme, Q fever, rabbit fever, Rocky, and there's, also, there's all kinds of Rocky. Know this, Lyme was first discovered in Lyme, Connecticut. Rocky Mountain was, spotted fever was first discovered in the Rockies. More people die in North Carolina from Rocky Mountain spotted fever than any other state. It's very prevalent in the East Coast. Uh, People come here diagnosed with the big three if they've been to three to five or ten Lyme doctors. BART, babesiosis, and Lyme. And that can be the least of their problems many times. Uh, we treat it all. And the toughest, the toughest thing to treat, in my opinion, are parasites, these damn parasites in the gut. Excuse my French. They can drop 20,000, 60,000 eggs a day. Um, clove will kill the eggs. But the, we have a natural parasite kill I designed that's very potent. But, um, and a lot of these parasites make their way to the brain. It's called neurocysticercosis. Look it up. And there's, there are recent MRI studies from American universities where neuroradiologists, in coordination with microbiologists, have proven at least 2% at least 2 of Americans have worms in their brain. And it was 13% of Hispanic immigrants in Southern California. Um, Sushi is a bad idea, folks. Eating sushi is the number one cause of the rise of neurocysticercosis. And it's not just what Spinagra says, it's what neuroimmunologists and microbiologists are saying. Um, a lot of worms in, in raw fish. One of my Oregon patients sent me a study on salmon. So these are little pearls that you need to focus on. Valerie from Florida, are you there now? Waiting for Valerie. <clears throat> Valerie, are you there? Okay, she may have gotten tired. I want you to notice way less light blue besides the yellow infection. Uh, in the cerebellar, uh, you can calculate it fairly quickly. It's a fraction, 2 to 0.5. It's 150% improvement in activity. I don't know if you calculated that. We have uh, folks, I always have a a lot of engineering fathers and even mothers. I have a PhD in physical chemistry here as a patient. So I asked my patients to calculate some of these. Uh, take me to Maria's PET scan while we're talking about neurocysticercosis. Let's take a question from someone um, from wherever. Okay, wow. Okay. Patrick from Missing, can we smell mold and others not? We covered that earlier. Those who have been exposed to a lot of hidden black mold and have had a lot of trichotoxicity, trichothecine, they've got destruction of the olfactory cells right through the nose, the sinuses, and, and kill the sense of smell, olfactory smell. So some people can't smell it. But like Carol mentioned about being more sensitive, when you wake up the brain, you wake up the brain. And people who can't smell the must in grandma's house smell it when they go back. Women come here and they don't smell the must in the mall the first week. And two weeks later, they say, hey, Doc, you know, I went to that mall. I won't say which one. They're all bad. <laughs> and I didn't smell any must when I first came here. Uh, but, geez, uh, is so-and-so mall musty or so-and-so store? <laughs> I said, absolutely. And so it doesn't take long to wake up your brain, and that sense of smell will come back. Um, Sarah from New York. 
How do I get rid of mycotoxins in my body? Well, we've covered that. Look, you can spend forever to do it. Um, can you read the results? Oh, it's Barbara from Illinois. Okay. The mycotoxins, you will slowly get rid of them on your own. Um, <clears throat> you can use various things uh, to pull them out. You can use cholestyramine, like Dr. Shoemaker talks about. Um, it's effective. When I was toxic, I tried it. It made me so constipated. But you can use vitamin C crystals, other things to counteract that. My problem with cholestyramine uh, is that, again, that it pulls out good fats and bad fats, including your fatty vitamins A, K, E, etc. But again, it pulls out cholesterol. I have said since 2000, lowering cholesterol is a dumb idea. And I have friends that will tell me on the tennis court, well, I got John's cholesterol down to 140, and I want to smack him with a tennis racket because they won't listen. Listen, uh, all your hormones come out of cholesterol. You could, if you can flip to that one quickly, show them, because we got one of our patients here, actually, she's fast on this. And, and actually, Doug was a patient five years ago from Pittsburgh. So proud of Doug. He came here mold toxic uh, in 2012. And, and he wasn't that bright, but I knew he was. I knew he was a genius. And we woke up his brain. And is he here? Oh, there he is. <laughs> And he just finished four years of pre-med at Pitt. Once we woke up his brain in 2012, I said, you are brilliant. You have to go to medical school. And Doug finished his fourth year of pre-med. He spent a year with me to try to help me publish some of this research. Notice, folks, the cholesterol, nothing above it, becomes the mother hormone, pregnenolone. I made a pregnenolone you can chew. You guys have broken transporters in the intestinal lining. You, I made pregnenolone you can chew, DHA you can chew, and vitamin D you can chew. And you, you know, you got to know this pathway to know what's going on. Some of you women who have painful bleeding, heavy bleeding, you lack this arrow. That arrow is an enzyme. I had two sisters from Texas recently. One drug her leg. She drug her leg for 10 years and said nothing. Texas tough, a 22-year-old. And they, they had no, they had plenty of pregnenolone even though they had trico gut, which is no absorption ability, but no progesterone. So it's more of a genetic thing. If you don't convert downstream, they convert to the right. So we, do we do hormones? We don't put hormone balance and imbalance, but it's like the basic of basics of what we do. Um, you have to know what's going on, and you can, without ordering $2,000 enzyme tests from a university, if you use process elimination deductive reasoning and you've memorized the biochemical pathways, you can determine what's going on. Estrone, there's a good one, a bad one, by the way. Breast cancer is big. Um, do you know only 5% of breast cancer is related to the BRCA gene? 95% is caused by environmental toxins. Now, what's amazing to me is that at Camp Lejeune, 35 years ago, they had a big leak in the diesel tank and the male Marines and the females on the base were getting breast cancer. The kids all got leukemia. Uh, but I know trico is causing breast cancer. Uh, the prostate, men, is the breast of the male. Similar tissue. It's the 16-hydroxyestrone that causes the cancer. 17-hydroxy is actually protective. Aromatase enzyme will bring andro down the estrone. And it will also convert testosterone to estradiol. You testosterone dominant women can have a deficiency of this enzyme. It's just a ratio. You, you, you can do curls and build muscle 10 times faster than your girlfriends in the gym. You also have more kill power because testosterone activates IL-6 cytokine, which activates killer cells. So we play with hormones a lot. It's um, you got to get them just right. And I don't like the pellets because every patient I see with a pellet has an imbalance. Uh, you know, the pellet's fine if you get it right, but if you've got things out of balance, it's not good. Progesterone is the number one hormone, I want to say this before I forget, for healing the myelin sheath in men and women. And so I do put men on bioidentical progesterone if they have none. It's made in our adrenals. Um, so there's a lot of things I teach that you have no idea what I do from the website. And I should have had Lisa or Carol. I, there's, we do way more than what's on our website. We have all kinds of babesiosis slides. We have 
parasite slides we could show you. We don't have those things on the website because I work 80 hours a week usually and I don't feel like doing more pages, but we should do chemo brain. The chemotherapy, they're fatty lipophilic toxins. They saturate the brain. We can wake up chemo brain from your breast cancer chemo probably in three weeks. Again, if you just had the breast cancer, I'm not saying just, or any cancer, cancer patients are easier to treat than Lyme patients because they don't tend to have all the biofilm. Um, and we don't advertise for cancer we've treated for years. You want to keep the estrone down. And, um, you know, the prostate cancer that we have treated, uh, it doesn't take that long. And I will, for cancer patients, use megadose vitamin C. If you use it in patients with toxin-saturated biofilm, they can have a big pop. I've got a patient from England who just took some serapeptase on the Cowden protocol and heart rate jumped to 180-200. Why? Toxin balloon burst, toxins roll out of biofilm through the free-floating bloodstream, shut down the glutamic acid decarboxylase. Give me that glutamate GABA slide if you can, one time. And so then the glutamate that can't convert to the GABA, it's research we performed here at Spinagal Wellness. This enzyme, glutamic acid decarboxylase, is shut down from certain chemicals. And so when it hit the free-floating bloodstream, the glutamate can surge. Uh, 20 is kind of a normal, assuming you have a reasonable glutamine. In a 6 GABA, we neutralize a 20 glutamate. You have to remember, I've done 12,000 neurotransmitter tests. So you know, throughout the country, glutamate's up, GABA's down. Throughout the industrialized world, um, not just the country. So glutamate is the very first step in the 11-step electrical pathway for electrical pain pathways. Glutamate activates the NMDA receptor. Lyrica blocks it, but that's tr symptom treatment, not causation treatment. I have dropped glutamate from 4,000, and we actually have a slide we presented out at the Integrated Mental Health Symposium uh, in California back in September. We can bring a 4,000 glutamate down to normal in days. Um, the glutamate activates NMDA, which opens the calcium channel. And when calcium goes in the nerves, particularly the cardiac nerves, there's excess voltage. We call it cardiac irritability. And we treat it here. I have patients who go into AFib from Lyme carditis. I have patients who have AV block from Lyme. In Germany, they say if you have AV block and you're under 40, it's Lyme to prove it otherwise. I see more right bundle branch blocks with Bartonella, Bart heart, I call it. But the opposite is when you get cardiac arrhythmias, I'd like to know, ask people to raise their hands, how many people on the phone have palpitations? You feel your heart skipping beats. I will guarantee you glutamate GABA mismatch from toxicity um, by, and so forth. So um, let's go on to... Um, Oh, keto, ketogenic diet? Bring them on. Um, I recommend ketogenic diet. Well, we'll wait, we'll ask, we'll ask a question. Well, okay, we should cover more people, but I'll answer it because it's for everybody. Good question, Emil. Great question. Um, look, there's all kinds of diets for various things. And I hate arbitrary medicine. And... Um, I do recommend good fats, so more of a ketogenic diet for my patients because my patients are all severely neurotoxic. If you're going to heal the fattiest part of the body, the myelin sheath, not only on the brain nerves but on the sciatic nerve, etc., you need a lot of good fatty acids. We have certain, you know, everybody knows about omega-3s and 6s and 9s, and you guys know what food. Uh, phosphatidylcholine, we do it intravenously. The, the best food source is the yolk of an egg for phosphatidylcholine. Um, every cell membrane is 50% phosphatidylcholine, by the way. But I recommend a diet of good fats, so ketogenic diet, more so even than a Mediterranean diet. 
some of the worst cholesterol levels I see. And now that you've learned that that myelin sheath consists 25% of cholesterol, you know, you know who's more likely to get MS? Give me a woman who's imbalanced genetically, estrogen dominant over progesterone. So she's a heavy bleeder, painful bleeder. And if you don't get the progesterone pumped up to match more evenly, by late 20s, they'll get endometriosis and unnecessary procedures. But more importantly, you need that progesterone to heal the myelin sheath. You need good fats. I recommend the middle chain triglycerides. Uh, I recommend you use coconut oil for anything you, you fry, or stir fry, whatever. Um, I eat it like it's peanut butter. Uh, I prefer goat cheese because it's an A2 protein. Um, you can go back to Maria's brain scan. I want to teach him a couple of things about that. So um, avocados, look, you can read on anybody's site. I guess we should do a, a food thing, but you can find, this is elementary wellness. Uh, diet plans. Um, you can read it anywhere. The things I'm teaching you, you can't learn anywhere else. The, the brain science and, and the correlations of the scans and so forth. Um, but you can read on any one site what you should eat. And it's not that difficult to know. Um, if God made it, eat it. <laughs> I told my mother-in-law that in the third year of medical school when she assumed we were getting some nutritional courses, which we didn't. The caveat is dairy products if we just leave things alone but we started interbreeding cows our gut was made to digest a2 protein which cow milk was initially goat milk is camel milk is but then we started interbreeding cows we have an a1 protein and a lot of you folks who have problems with dairy besides having a case and allergy um, you have problems because you can't digest the A1 protein. So, but you want cholesterol, you want your cholesterol no lower than 180. HDL, LDL, overrated a little bit. By the way, uh, the German scientists proved years ago trichothecine toxicity by overwhelming the liver causes triglycerides and LDL to be elevated and causes sludging in the gallbladder, which causes unnecessary cholecystectomies. I had five women here about six months ago at one time who had their gallbladder taken out. I said, it wasn't stones, was it? It was sludging. They said, how'd you know? Um, look, I've read research from all over the world and perform our own, and you see these patterns. Uh, and so these are things you need to know. But eat the good fats. If you think you have mycotoxin toxicity or petrotoxicity, and there's no chance you don't um, living in this country. And I don't see it from Scottsdale. You know, certain cities, I don't see it. I see the petro stuff. But anyway, um, who's this? Nikki, Nikki from North Carolina. We're waiting for Nikki. All right, Nikki, are you there? Hello? Hi, Nikki. Hey. I think we have two or three North Carolina patients right now. The land of the Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Just kidding. <laughs> anyway, what's your question, Nikki? Um, I was wondering if glutathione crosses the blood-brain barrier to remove the mold toxins. Yeah. If not, what does? Yes, it does. And people say it doesn't. Uh, but you need the R isomer, okay? Uh, some people say it doesn't. I don't know. People say a lot of things. Uh, and actually, I'm going to have you go to Leanne's. We need to talk about Gilbert's disease. People diagnosed with genetic liver failure. That's not. It's trico. So we have a kid from England. We'll show you some numbers on. Uh, the other thing is, <clears throat> um, I've said three times a night, if you have mycotoxin toxicity and or petroleum toxicity, you don't have an intact blood-brain barrier any more than you have an intact intestinal lining. So just like drug of choice, supposedly for neurolyme might be rocephin because it it's less of a bipolar positive negative and will cross 
blood-brain barrier better. Well, guess what? In my patients, any antibiotic will cross the blood-brain barrier. And that's the problem. What we see in the blood smear, whether it's liver flukes or bigger parasites, it's amazing how many people have them. The, the one-celled protozoa parasites, of which there are hundreds, um, whatever you see in the blood smear in my patients, you'll see on the PET scans most of the time. We have so much research we want to, pu want to publish on you folks. So, um, but the other thing is, <clears throat> um, to show you how quickly in severely toxic patients there's an equilibrium from the brain to the blood to the gut, I've seen people wake up their brain just in a good colonic. Um, and, um, but if you bring the blood level of the toxins down, then you slowly move the toxins out of the brain. Um, the blood level, but, de but what we have found is simply doing intravenous glutathione, it takes forever to desaturate a brain that is saturated with these fatty lipophilic toxins. So, um, and there are plenty of studies on giving exogenous glutathione and even NAC, and by the way, none of you folks have NAC. You all taking N-acetylcysteine, uh, and I can prove I've proven. Well, we have. You guys have all kinds of things. Uh, these toxins are shutting down the acetylation enzyme that converts cysteine to NAC, which becomes glutathione. Uh, people are always surprised. Well, I'm taking a ton of that. Yeah, I know you are. You're taking a ton of a lot of things that you, that you don't. Um, you don't absorb some, and some, it's the enzymes. Um, so it's a great question, but studies have proven that giving people exogenous glutathione, because you can't make enough, when your gut lining is destroyed and you can't absorb the amino acids, you know, you have three amino acids that become glutathione. So the more toxic you are, the more destruction of the gut lining, the less you absorb the essential amino acids the less glutathione you make, yet the more you need, and actually the lowest essential amino acid is typically methionine, which is at the top of a pathway we'll show you in a moment, to get the glutathione. But that's a good question. So studies have proven that if you give it exogenous, oral, not as good as IV, whatever, that you increase glutathione levels within the cytoplasm of the cells and within the mitochondria. Does that answer your question a little bit? Okay, good question though. Great questions tonight. Um, thank you, Nikki. Uh, did you have another question? Um, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, well that's good. Well, you may come up, think of another one after we talk some more. How about Barbara? Well, give me somebody that's on there waiting. You got somebody waiting? Um, these are just folks. Dory from California. It's still um, early out in California. And we got Roger from California. Got Dory. Dory. Um, great question, Dory. How do you know if you should treat Lyme or mold infections first? Can mold prevent as Lyme? Oh, present as Lyme disease. Great questions. Um, do you want to ask another question or add to that, Dory, before I answer the ones that you emailed in? Oh, okay, that's fine. We can hear you. Well, th this is a great question. It's a horse cart deal somewhat. Um, there are a lot of Lyme specialists, and they're bright Lyme doctors, who have stated that the Lyme spirochete is shutting down the immune system, and that allows mold to overgrow. Uh, and I may be wrong, but you folks are my subjects, and again, the test that we do is sophisticated and... You, you have to correlate that CD4, CD8 ratio. That's my research on trico alone and on petrotoxin levels. German scientists simply proved that trichothecine shuts down bone marrow production of killer cells in rats. Okay? Um, you correlate these levels, like for mycotoxins, uh, with antibody levels. And there's, we've correlated all these things. That's going to be Doug's job to start publishing those things. Um, and then he'll be 
published on so many things that nobody's published, guaranteed to go wherever he wants for medical school. So here's the way it works. You have to understand how immunosuppressive the mycotoxins are. Okay? And once you do, and once you've done your own studies, because there's so many myths out there, like the methylation myth we'll talk about in a little bit. That'll stir a lot of you guys up uh, and your doctors. Um, let me just make it very simple. The methylation enzymes are shut down way more from trichothecine than the genetic SNPs. And uh, we've proven it, and I can talk about it maybe later. Um, don't know what time it is. But here's, the, here's what you folks have proven to me when I've correlated <clears throat> ocrotoxin, gliotoxin, very immunosuppressive, trichothecine, we've done the most correlation with various trichos. Um, you correlate that, those levels, with suppression of killer cells. I, oh, it's 11.30. Well, good, we're just getting started. See, these young folks can't keep up because they're not, their mitochondria aren't optimized like mine. All right, so um, here's the deal. The mycotoxins destroy the gut lining, including the Peyer's patch, the antibody factory. They shut down the bone marrow production of the natural killer cells. And in the worst cases, um, I hate to ask you to bounce, but you know, um, Dennis, who's on the website, we should have a thousand PET scans before and after on the website, but you know his buddy, George, that came from southern Louisiana? Anyway, you don't have to go there, I suppose, but it'd be in the front of the 700 slides, but it comes with a white count of 2,000. It's a, so we see total suppression of the white blood cells as a whole. And many of the women that come here and have a book of physicians they've seen, and many times the white count was down at 3,000 or 3,200, and it wasn't ever circled. Now, here's what's really sad. CLIA, the government agency in America, forces labs to go out every so many years and, and retest a bunch of folks and produce a 95% bell-shaped curve. When LabCorp went out in the fall of <clears throat> 2014, suddenly the norm changed. For years, the low for white blood cell count was 4,000 on average to 11,000. The new low was considered to be normal at 3,400. That would be leukopenia, lack of white cells. We've seen white cell counts down at 1,900, the entire white cell count. That's how much suppression of the bone marrow you can get with trichothecine. It also shuts down production of red blood cells. So you, su you suppress, you destroy the antibody factor to Peyer's patch, particularly with the trichothecines. And again, the French research is the best. Look it up, folks. Go to PubMed, University of Marseille, Trichothecine, you'll see a 2003-2009 study. They've got it down to the intracellular level, how these toxins, the trichos, destroy the transporters. So you can eat protein shakes, drink them every hour, and still can't gain weight. Um, you gain weight with mitochondria shut down. Females have more issues with this. They can eat two peas a day and can't lose weight. But you can get to the point where your gut lining is so destroyed. I've, I had a girl from Alabama, 5'10", 80 pounds, uh, just massive black mold infestation in her bedroom. So you get to the point, in the worst case, where you don't absorb anything. You have to remember when trichothecines are used in biological warfare and sprayed in the air, the victims below bleed out and die in a few hours. Where do they bleed out from? The intestine. So, the mycotoxins shut down the bone marrow production of killer cells they destroyed the intestinal lining and the Peyer's patch, the antibody factory. So now you got both halves of the immune system. And then you got trico. Our research now, but German research before that in rats, shutting down TNF alpha, the primary cytokine that moves around the body, activating kill power. I've not had one Lyme patient come to this clinic who ever had their TNF alpha measured. <clears throat> and again, before you get a vaccine, whether you're 70, or it's your seven-year-old, the certain immune biomarkers that should be tested. So you know if, the, if your son or daughter's immune system or your immune system can, can win. The, the goal is to make more antibodies to the virus. 
And I've treated a lot of kids with encephalitis. And my God, that Gardasil vaccine, I've had a lot of young girls who got encephalitis from the Gardasil vaccine. Um, if your immune system's healthy, it's okay. Like, the, like Ellie, who was talking about being in the hospital and they made her take the hep B vaccine. I danced around it, and thank God I did, because I can tell you my immune system was uh, no good back in the days when I spent a lot of time in moldy hospitals. Um, so the way it works, in my opinion, and you folks have proven it, I like numbers, they prove everything, they don't lie. The toxins shut down the immune system, and then you can't kill the Lyme. Many times a husband brings his wife, and if you do the testing, even DNA memory testing, if nothing else, you can prove that the, that, um, the, the, father, the, the husband has been infected with Lyme. Lyme is passed sexually. That's a question everybody asks. It's been found in semen. It's been found in vaginal secretions. You're worried about Lyme? Worry about Bartonella. Read a Bartonella deal I wrote one laying in bed with a kidney infection several years ago. Um, I was swimming in the golf, and they dumped a bunch of sewage in the golf. It's a long story. And doing a backstroke, and then they get this infection. E. coli, resistant to every antibiotic known to man. It's from the cattle yards and in the beef yards. And, you know, I killed it naturally. I had no choice. But I wrote a, a deal on Bartonella in our soldiers. And is the Iraq war causing more Bartonella? Because they proved the dogs in Iraq, 47% had Bartonella. That's antibody testing. It misses half of it. The sand fleas are carrying mycoplasma, they're carrying BART, and one of our staff, Amy, who served in Iraq, said those dogs were BART crazy. They acted like they had rabies. They would attack the soldiers. They had to shoot some of their dogs, and they tested them for rabies. They weren't rabies. They had BART. Um, BART rage in humans, BART rage in dogs, uh, and maybe in cats, you know. <laughs> but I'm just teasing a little bit. Don't kill your cat. Get them tested for BART. Do DNA testing at least. Anyway, um, so the mycotoxins shut down your immune system so you can't kill the Lyme. I have never had a chronic Lyme patient who didn't have mycotoxicity. Okay? Just haven't seen it. I'm sure they're out there. When you can wrap your brain around the fact that mosquitoes are carrying Lyme. November 2015, look it up on PubMed from Frankfurt, Germany. They proved it. The spirochete's much bigger than BART. Mosquitoes are carrying BART. No one talks about it, but surely if they can carry that big, long spirochete, they can carry that little tiny BART. But if you think about mosquitoes carrying spirochetes, and you can't say every mosquito carries them, every tick doesn't, not every tick carries Lyme spirochetes. But you wrap your head around the fact you've had thousands of mosquito bites. I believe, and I may be wrong, but I believe that the majority of Americans and Folks who go outside and have cookouts have been infected with Lyme. And you see it all the time. And if you have a healthy spouse and they're ping-ponging Lyme and you have a sick, typically a wife, not always, but we're 82% female. Of course, men, we're all in denial, aren't we? Uh, but the deal is, the, the male, his idea of just health food is a chili dog with Coca-Cola, big gulp. <laughs> His wife eats so neurotically perfectly. Um, some, of them won't, some people won't, won't even eat honey. They're afraid of candida overgrowth. Honey activates the immune system. Uh, if John the Baptist could live on locusts and honey, I imagine honey's good for you. Uh, I have a gut cleanse that I've designed. It's about eight herbals. It will smite, as the Bible says, it will smite candida in clostridia in SIBO. It's just it's, it's not an issue here. Um, so it's not just Lyme, to answer your question, Dory. In California, it has been certain times our number one state for patients. <clears throat> you have a lot of Lyme spirochetes out there. There's guys at Stanford studying Lyme. You've got the West Coast Babesias, Dunconis, et cetera, et cetera. But no one ever comes here with just Lyme. Many of them think they have it. Roger from California, are you available to review, interpret spec scans and PETs? You know, I actually have been talking to the folks here. I may start doing that. Um, I've got a, I'm very busy, but I can, I can do that. Um, and I've compared a lot of specs that people have had at various places. 
two PETs, which are much more informative uh, than the SPECT, but they're both great scans. Um, I wanted to show you this gentleman. Uh, again, the white count was, uh, where's the white count? 2.2. And we're told it takes nine days to make new white blood cells. <clears throat> we can raise the white blood cell count from two to 5,000 in one day. We have, a, again, a physician's kit here. We did it in, uh, in this kit who popped a bunch of trico at a biofilm and he dropped way down and dad, run, dad runs ICUs. He's a brilliant doctor from out of country. Um, and um, he's like, oh my God, you know, what are we gonna do? I said, don't worry, doc, I'll have it back to normal in a day. Uh, but you have to remove those toxins from the bloodstream and they no longer marinate the bone marrow and it's amazing how quickly the white count will come up and so I'm not so sure studies proven it takes nine days was it all in toxic people I, I don't know the answer all I know is we can lose someone like George from two two to five one whatever we see it all the time um, but you can also see people go way down so go to Leanne again uh, we're going to wrap it up in a few moments. I want to talk about the liver again. Um, we have so many people to come in here diagnosed with Gilbert's disease. <clears throat> and January 16, we had a brilliant neonatal nurse from Aspen. And at the same time, we had this young kid from um, England, show, let me see her billy room first, I guess. We'll come, or we, can, we can do this. Homocysteine, let's do billy room. This young lady was a soccer player. Her father was a professional. She was arguably the best female soccer player in England up to age 12. <clears throat> age 13, 12, somewhere, she goes into a really old high school. Us Americans think old is 60 years old. Look in England and in Europe. I mean, I've had folks that worked in government buildings that were 600 years old. It's way more decades of water intrusion. Those buildings did not have airtight windows and doors until after the oil embargo by 1980. And so this young lady <clears throat> never had her bilirubin tested. Why would a young healthy kid who's playing soccer in the best in the country, perhaps as a female at her age, have chemistries. So when they start testing her bilirubin, it's elevated. So she's told by physicians in London, as was our Colorado patient. I've had actually uh, several patients referred by Dr. Bartley out in uh, Boulder, and one of the attorneys she referred recently had the same thing, diagnosed with Gilbert's disease. Genetic liver failure. Well, they never tested her before she had trico poisoning. Notice she was 2.8. That is turning yellow, like your jaundice baby. Uh, Billy Rubin at 1-4, within four days, I think, of treatment. Yeah, April 15th, April 19th, uh, we pretty much had gotten rid of the genetic liver failure. Looks like Gilbert's disease. Uh, and then we got her down to 0.7, I think, a week or so later. And I said, please email this to your parents who have believed for 12 or 13 years that you have genetic liver failure. I'm always amazed patients are told these things without testing the parents. Um, but we've heard it for years. So if you've been told that, or if you see that your bilirubin is climbing, and bilirubin is a late sign. The one out of three Americans and the one out of three people in the industrialized world, where are the windows and doors airtight in the industrialized world? Not out in the jungle. Where are the petrotoxins? Not out in the middle of Botswana where I've heard from one of my actor patient friends that the beef is incredible, but you travel eight hours on a dirt road to get to the villages. There's no toxicity, no petrotoxicity, no airtight windows and doors, and there's no non-alcoholic fatty liver. One out of three Americans. You will have non-alcoholic fatty liver. I diagnosed it in eight-year-old kids, 10-year-old kids, and 30-year-old kids, whatever. So you'll have non-alcoholic fatty liver long before your bilirubin goes up. We were taught in traditional medicine. Liver failure <clears throat> occurs when your bilirubin goes up. Long before your bilirubin goes up, you fail to conjugate iron. 
And six, seven years ago, I told my nurses, that's the first sign of liver failure, hemochromocytosis. But then as I paid more attention, it's all about paying attention to what you guys show me in the numbers. You correlate all that, then you put all the numbers and science to the side, and you listen to the story. And the patients will teach you. Patients are the teachers, but they can't teach you anything if you haven't read the, the deeper science. You gotta get or you gotta get to in your thought process and treat on a biochemical, intracellular, mitochondrial level. The first thing that goes up is, is ammonia. But is ammonia elevated because you have SIBO? A chapter I uh, wrote in 2012 for Brenda Watson <clears throat> about the SIBO bacteria that convert dietary urea that should go to repair your brain, your heart, your skin to excess ammonia. Uh, those same bacteria still trip the fan and make a toxin called kynurenic acid. So you have to use numbers from different tests to use a process of elimination to determine is this ammonia elevated because the patient has Klebsiella, Proteus, Interbacteriaceae, overgrowing the small intestine, stealing tryptophan, or stealing urea, I'm sorry, making excess ammonia, or is it from a liver that can't handle the ammonia? And I have such brilliant women, and I gotta say to you folks, I'm impressed. Uh, the women that come here, they've been everywhere. They've read everything. They know way more about gut toxicity than we ever learned in medical school. And they've done everything you can do. They've taken every herbal, they've taken everyone's protocol. They've been chelated to death. And they've taken their heavy metals from the ceiling level to the floor. Didn't change their chronic fatigue. Didn't change their brain fog. The heavy metals aren't good for you, but they are nothing in lethality compared to these fatty toxins. And so how do you know that? How do you say that with such arrogance or confidence? Patience. The patient who's had all kinds of IV chelation and their heavy metals are at nothing. They were sky high, they're nowhere. Because she paid for IV chelation for whatever time period. Why is she here? Why she still have chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, neuropathy, brain fog, frontal lobe dementia, whatever. <clears throat> the lipophilic toxins are much more lethal. So, the trico in the high school is what did this to Leanne. I was so excited to send normal Billy Rubin back to the parents. Flip back to the home assistant, if you would. Um, there are people out there, I won't mention the name of, of a biochemist who talks a lot about methylation, <clears throat> and she's a sweet lady, I can tell from um, just her research, and she has an autistic kid, but she'll tell you if your homocysteine is real high, you can't give higher doses of glutathione, and you can't even use glutathione. And <clears throat> Actually, um, go back to the biochemical pathway on methionine to glutathione. Well, stay here for one second, my bad. Just go back one. Notice <clears throat> we brought our homocysteine down. 59, you old folks know your internist is measuring homocysteine. It inflames the capillaries and causes excessive clotting, strokes, heart attacks. And your internist is all over it. We brought it from 59 to 7. I don't know, was it a week? What was it? No, that's actually measured in March, but we don't take that long. But you can do that in a week. We may not have retested it. I don't know. But go, go back one slide. I want to teach these folks something. If you l study the pathways, and we got five minutes, we're going to wrap it up. And you know the biochemical enzymes and pathways. <clears throat> you do know that glutathione can convert backwards to excessive homocysteine. But we brought Leanne's homocysteine down, and homocysteine of hundreds of patients. You bring it down within days, not with a piddly dose of glutathione. If you measure all the numbers at one time, you will see that trichothecine, I'm not sure about the petrochemicals yet. I, the problem is when you have a patient with multiple chemicals, it's, it's difficult to, to uh, say too many variables, but when patients have no petrochemicals, they live out in the middle of nowhere, but they got a terrible, terrible house regarding black mold. 
the methionine synthase enzyme that converts bad homocysteine to methionine shuts down. And you'll notice methionine is low and typically one of the lowest of the essential amino acids in trichotoxic patients. Um, and actually, it is by removing the trichothecenes from the bloodstream that this enzyme kicks in and homocysteine converts to methionine. Methionine goes up, homocysteine goes down. Um, methionine becomes SAMe, it grabs a methyl group, a carbon and three hydrogens. And the SAMe is very important for making cartilage and repair. And by the way, Chinese research again proves that trichothecenes destroy cartilaginous tissue. Uh, in ligaments, etc. There's one study in the world. It's from China. You have to read research from all over. SAMe is used for lots of good things, uh, for DNA, RNA repair, and of course trichothecenes and other mycotoxins cause DNA, RNA fragmentation. Trichothecenes have been proven to shut down the RNA 28S ribosome. I can go on for hours about the intracellular destruction uh, by these mycotoxins. So the SAMe comes downstream and we get the homocysteine. Um, this particular PhD says if you have the upregulation of the CBS enzyme, you cannot use a lot of glutathione because you end up with too much cystathione <clears throat> and then cysteine. And between the cysteine and glutathione, you have to acetylate the cysteine again. And that enzyme is shut down, but they don't show that in the pathways. It's one more step. <clears throat> so really what we do here is we try to get your body and your brain back to a Garden of Eden state. And your body and brain, the way it was built, will work to get everything in homeostasis. And I am flabbergasted by the things that, that you can repair if you get the Tower of Babylon out, look, just give me, that, give me that mountain meadow for the end of this thing. We start our workshops normally with epigenetics versus genetics. Trichothecine shuts down the methylation enzymes more than the SNPs. And again, if you've got a double 677, golly gee whiz, didn't you have that when you were a baby? Why were you all state soccer player? Why were you all state basketball? Why were you very successful with a double 677 methylation problem for 30 years, 38 years until the firehouse flooded, police station flooded, your home flooded, or you moved into the wrong office, your basement flooded. Look, guys, common sense must prevail. And deductive reasoning says that the SNPs that you had since you're a baby are not the big issue. So it's epigenetics. Epigenetics versus genetics, and God gave us this, and we made this. And even in Leviticus, God told Moses, if mold comes back on the wall of the dwelling, have the wall removed. Fairly amazing, because 6,000 years ago, there were no airtight homes or buildings. Still said, get it out. So God bless you guys. I uh, hope you learned a lot. Um, and we'll probably do another webinar in a couple weeks. The next one, we're going to focus on infection in the brain and toxins. Um, it's a talk I gave at ILADS uh, a year ago, and we'll show you how you can have terrible vision, yet your retina and your cornea is fine. Uh, one of the cases, um, I, I suppose they can find that webinar on YouTube, um, Lyme disease and mold toxicity, um, double trouble for the brain. <clears throat> it's a webinar I did a year ago. If you go to the end of the five-hour webinar and you back up 15 minutes, look for Denise on a PET scan. You see all this yellow underactivity in the visual area, the brain camera. You have to remember the retina sends the electronic message to the brain camera back in the occipital lobe. And uh, this particular patient was 22,000, and she left here 2020, uh, validated by a retinal specialist down the road. It was the infection in the brain, which also causes light sensitivity. So there's lots more to teach you guys. I want to thank you guys for joining us. Um, I'm giving, everybody's telling me what to say. Oh, so if you have, uh, you're interested in learning more about our program, um, call, email, and patient coordinator will get back to you. 
Uh, and uh, again, it's been a pleasure to teach you tonight. Take care. Thank you.